And we are live. This is Dark Journalist. Oh, what a fantastic crowd we have out there in the ideas room tonight already. Of course, tonight I am joined by the lovely Olivia. Hi, everybody. And uh, Olivia, the breakaways are, are breaking in. Yes, they are. <laughs> this is the theme of tonight's show. And, um, you know, we've gone in about X Protect and the breakaways so that there's some sort of knowledge base there. And what's going to happen tonight is I'm going to explore and show you in depth how this group is ready. They're, they're moved into position to move this technology that they have through government agencies out to the public for profit and uh, for domination. And uh, tonight's episode is dedicated to it. This is X series 153. We've got it tonight. It's UFO file wars, the breakaway breaks back in the rise of X protect. And I'm going to go through the characters uh, who they are and how we can identify the nature of this. There's a ton of news mixed into this uh, and all the COG characters, the continuity of government players come out to play in all this, but there's an arc of history and we're talking all the way back to world war II and through the Kennedy years and through the Reagan years, uh, Nixon, and of course, the Clinton <laughs> years as well. So quite fascinating um, piece that we're going to get into tonight. And what we're going to answer the question really of what is the nature of this group that we're talking about? And they've been able to function in the background with the X technology. What is the nature of the advantage that they hold? And how can they roll this out to an unsuspecting public uh, with a glib media just accepting uh, what they say as the intelligence puppets that they are. We're going to be taking your questions in uh, part two of tonight's program, and you can ask those all in caps, and Miss Olivia is going to be putting those together, so you can literally ask them anytime, and we're going to tag them all on to the last hour of tonight's show, which should go a couple of hours here. And uh, before we go any further, I want to remind everyone to go ahead and sign up for the Dark Journalist newsletter uh, which is a free newsletter at our website, darkjournalist.com. Make sure that you're, you stand up and be counted on that because we have some exciting things uh, coming up that I just don't trust the yeah. social media companies <laughs> to handle. Uh, we've been under a lot of censorship as it goes, but uh, we, power, we power on through, as we say. But before I go any further, Miss Olivia, how are we doing? Good. Michael Williams says, don't sugarcoat it, DJ. Give it to us hard and fast. And Space Ghost said, I need some DJ. The world's gone crazy. <laughs> well, I can appreciate that. Well, uh, tonight is actually, we're going to go so serious and deep with this. And what's fascinating is everything that we've been working on is so timely. And there's a kind of a crisscross moment where the research that you're doing, which is ahead or advanced of the curve, crisscrosses with things that are happening in the public specter. So you get a full view of, of what's hanging out there to come. And of course, you know, uh, I think there are already indications with the forces in the 2024 election that are taking shape. Uh, the big push against President Trump, the big push against Robert F. Kennedy Jr., um, who, you know, I mean, in different ways really represent a completely um, different direction for the country, constitutionally based and uh, more populist for sure. And in, in Kennedy's case, just really transparent. And, um, you know, he's, he's got this incredible program for America. And I think he needs to spell it out even more uh, than he has. They've been kind of catching him up in these big, long expositions about um, the medical pharmaceutical expertise that he has which is so important considering all the things that they pulled on us. But uh, I think he needs to expand that portfolio of conversation as well, because, you know, he's giving these kind of, you know, <laughs> free classes on uh, the treachery behind the pharmaceutical companies, which, um, you know, gave us with the COVID op a total martial law situation, which violated the constitution. So he's right to go after it, but they're trying to pigeonhole him with that. And that's not, uh, his, his only issue. He has a broad uh, palette of issues. And I've been putting on the record here that anyone in this race who is for transparency has to address the UFO file. And it's going to be a huge advantage with all the things they are rolling out. So when we get into that 2024 election, really, if Bobby's talking the UFO file, which he has been, and Trump is talking the UFO file, which he needs to, you know, he has, he has a lot of secrets around it because of his family. 
but he needs to position himself more on that because of the nature of the battle that's about to be waged on this and come out into the open. The battle has been going on behind the scenes for a long time, and we've been covering that here. Um, one of the things I want to point out right off the bat is a news story, which includes uh, Trump, and it's this just came up, and it's Donald Trump sparks suspicion he's about to be indicted again. So they're, they're readying now this other indictment, which is the Georgia votes one. And that one basically says that he called up Raffensperger and um, the secretary of state and said, you have to, you know, basically double check your ballots to, because I won and all that kind of good stuff. So this is a thin case as legal experts look at it. It doesn't have uh, any weight, neither do any of the other cases. The only thing that they've been hanging their whole hat on is this audio tape supposedly where he's waving around uh, plans to in invade Iran that were given to him by General Milley. And that, you know, it's this is the neocon wet dream to go in and bomb Iran. And he's sort of making fun of them <laughs> in it. But the problem is nobody held the documents or looked at them. So, you know, he can just, he literally in that case can just say those weren't the documents and that's, you know, then it's a, he said, she said thing. How do you resolve that? So um, the guy who's going after him has a vested interest, this Jack Smith, and uh, he's been over in the Netherlands doing these cases for the UN for the past decade. So, you know, we've been seeing a lot of this people outside of the country trying to influence the political process. And, um, you know, I think that there, there ought to be a real kind of careful investigation of what's going on in relation to that. This story, though, this, this would be indictment number three for Trump. Boy, do they want this guy. You have to wonder beyond the, you know, they've never indicted a president ever. Now this guy has three. So <laughs> what does that tell you? The numbers coming in, if you're looking at the polling situation, are a disaster for Biden. And um, they show Trump up against his Republican challengers by 35 points. It's a complete blowout. And then um, against Biden, he's winning handily. You know, I mean, it's like five to seven points, which is kind of dramatic at this point in the race. Um, then you have a whole host of Republican challengers and people. Um, and there's a, there's a UFO file thread through them, as I pointed out with DeSantis and uh, Bigelow Aerospace and all the incredible money they're dumping into his campaign and knowing that Bigelow is a huge, huge uh, UFO file advocate. Now, um, this is interesting, too, because on the Democrat side, all they're trying to do is silence Bobby and get him out of the picture, but because he's really speaking to the issues and um, we have a terrible situation with Stepford Biden, that administration is so corrupt. And uh, he's so out of it. He just gets up and walks out on these TV interviews. You saw that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have that clip from MSNBC of him just being like, okay, you know, I'm going to go now. And even the woman, you know, Nicole Wallace, she doesn't even get up. She's like, whoa, this is weird. So uh, this is the nature of the situation. You know, the whole thing is, is going to be a weird rollout. That's all there is to it. So we're kind of stuck in that whole uh sort of power base committee behind Biden running the picture on top. So they've decided all we have to do is use our media assets to keep hitting Bobby and we'll hit Bobby, you know, we'll say, Oh, he, you know, his, um, his wife, his second wife who passed away that she killed herself because he, you know, of him and uh, lots of, uh, you know, unsubstantiated stuff. And, they're going to, uh, you know, they've been trying to paint him as a kook and all these different things. Look, Bobby Kennedy is not only brought out of the closet that the Central Intelligence Agency assassinated President Kennedy and his own uh, father, Bobby Kennedy, who was about to become president in 1968. This is the ghost of America's past and uh, the great dreams that it dreamed when Kennedy was in the White House and how those were shot down when they removed Kennedy and then again when they removed uh, Bobby from running. So uh, this has been sitting there in the air and you know it hasn't gone away. And fundamentally, the Central Intelligence Agency has laid out every different type of thing for this. They've tried to blame everyone but themselves. You know, oh, there were some Cubans involved. Look, let me tell you something. 
uh, the, you know, the general thing is they still stick to that story about the lone gunman and all that nonsense, you know, and Oswald had a gun and he, you know, oh, he, he just happened to get lucky that he was on the presidential route, <laughs> all these things. So we've been living in lies and you really, you can't really go forward living in, in that nature of lying. So uh, in the actual DNA of the situation, there's a problem. So what I see, uh, this is kind of the great turnaround and it's within our grasp to do it. Now, one of the things I want to point out before we get into the full thing on tonight, and, and tonight is going to be extraordinary because there are some things going on in the background that involve uh, Northcom and tensions with Spacecom that get right to the heart of how they're going to launch this UFO threat um, piece. But one thing I want to say fundamentally is um, there's a, there's a kind of a purist snobbery thing going on in political circles. And uh, this is the thing with Bobby Kennedy, that they're trying to find on the alternative side, an independent side, little things that they you know don't like about him. Oh, 10 years ago, he said something about the environment. I don't like whatever. Look, this guy has brought more transparency in running for president in the last three months than we've seen most candidates do in their entire lives. <laughs> So, you know, we're talking about the vaccine, the CIA assassination squads, nuclear war in Russia. I mean, this is what we need to be talking about, you know, not, um, you know, some weird uh, trans issue that Biden wants to make the military trans or something. And um, a lot of people in the gay and trans communities don't like being used as a political football either. So, you know, it's not doing them any favors, letting these uh, people use these issues and, and create this whole kind of environment that we're in where you're not supposed to know your gender. And, you know, uh, they have a new bill in Michigan. This is a good old Gretchen's revenge, mm -hmm. but they have a new bill where uh, if you sort of do the, the wrong pronoun, you could be fined $10,000. I kid you not. So, you know, that's the kind of insanity that that side wants to play out. If you want the Democrats and insanity, that's what you get. Now there are no real, political parties at the deepest possible point. But I've pointed this out before, which is that on the independent side and on the Republican side, um, the people that the parties play to respect the Constitution. So the party line is the Constitution. Now, very often uh, with Republicans that are, you know, rhinos and all the rest of that, they will use you know, the, the rhetoric, but not do the stuff. But nonetheless, their audience, their constituency is a constitution-loving constituency. Somehow they made the Democrats crazy. <laughs> and the neocons invaded that party and made them think war was good, you know. And you have Greta, uh, <laughs> supposed to be, you know, the kid climate change activist going over to meet the great Zelensky. And you have Bono writing songs and painting t-shirts of him and you know, raising money for more war. Look, the Ukraine people are wonderful people and, um, you know, they shouldn't be in the midst of this, but we shouldn't use them as a political football because we want to move NATO right under Russia's nose. And uh, I think Russia can take the opportunity to step back on all that if we give them a peace process to sign on to. Unfortunately, our leadership's not doing that. It's a huge issue. And Bobby Kennedy uh, has an edge on that. I have to say, Trump came out and did an incredible thing at the last town hall. And um, Bobby Kennedy saluted him for it. He said, I, I'm going to end that war. And they were like, well, you know, do you want to win? And he said, I want to stop the killing. And this is what we have to be about because, you know, the media hides it and pretend there's, they're waving these flags and all that stuff. But all it is is money for the same uh, defense contractors who got us involved in the Vietnam War, who wanted to invade Cuba, who killed President Kennedy. I mean, it's the same group. And um, we're going to find ourselves face to face with this very same group in dealing with the UFO file, its cover up, and then them developing the technology in the background, developing this entirely different track uh, with their own medicine, their own science, and their own advanced technology. And now they're trying to weave that back into society with no one noticing by putting on a UFO threat. And so that is the breakaway is breaking back in. We're going to get into those hardcore details. Everyone, it's exciting to have you here for mm -hmm. X Series 153. Tonight we're going deep. This is UFO File Wars and um, the breakaway breaks in the rise of X Protect. We will take your questions in part two, as I said. And I'm going to jump in here, Miss Olivia, before I do, 
you're up. Uh, Willie's Met says, hey, DJ, do you think David Grush is Elizondo 2.0? And Mr. Fix says, are there SSP white hats? Yeah, well, I, I think this... Um, I know exactly what you mean. I think the terminology white hat, black hat is, is getting tricky because it was abused during the whole Q thing. So it gets very, very funky to talk about things in terms like that. Uh, I use this X share X protect piece. The X protect people are there to guard the secrecy and to advance the cause of a small group that considers itself very elite inside the world powers and the United States government. X share is a group that can operate on political, judicial, and um, journalistic terms. And they are um, in all different levels of society trying to do, they have the same level or some aspect of the same level of knowledge, and they're trying to move that out into the public. I've tried to identify the X-Share people. Certainly uh, the Kennedy uh, administration was the first public sort of X share uh, group and they wanted to take, you know, Kennedy's vision was to share this technology um, with the Russians and go to the moon together and no space race, no arms race and all that stuff. And um, people in that national security structure of the deep state felt that, you know, they knew better uh, one and two, that all the things that they had been accumulating as an advantage around the world with a secret system of finance and a secret technology system through the UFO file were at risk because this guy is going to basically share it with the other big power. And uh, their, so their strategy was, no, we'll continue this war economy and you know um, we'll continue posturing in this nuclear posture. And what we're going to do with him, since he represents not only an affront to everything that we're doing, but um, he also represents the end of the secrecy, is we're just going to eliminate him. And um, so you have the security service, the intelligence service in the United States killing its own commander in chief. That's the nature of the dysfunction that we've had going on and how, you know, we've had lots of historians explain it. We've had the media, you know, saying, oh, it's conspiracy theories. That's been going on for too long. And then everything has come kind of, Basically, since 9-11, we've come face to face with this thing. It's come out in different ways. And now they don't even hide their plans for consolidating your freedom. Uh, you know, they basically want to biochip you and uh, control what you can consume, where you can drive, what you can eat, who you can see, that whole thing. So they think they can achieve it through biometric means. And there's, there's a real danger in there. And there's also a, a huge esoteric aspect in it, which needs to be understood so the secret service, um, secret society side, the mystery school side can't be far from these discussions. When we get into aspects of the deep state or aspects of the deep technology, they're trying to roll out. There's almost going to be kind of a retail side of this, which is discussing how the players make a profit and consolidate power and all the rest of it. But underneath is something um, that is fundamentally mystical. And uh, so we have to understand their belief structure in order to get anywhere on this. So we're going to get into some of that tonight as well. And we're also going to find a weird crisscross with the mystery school aspect uh, around Penn State and its leaders and some of the people who were in charge of Penn State who were deep in the UFO file, but also had access to these uh, Firestone Atlantean ruins. And the strange crisscross there, if we can understand it or understand their study of it, we might get somewhere. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show, UFO File Wars, Breakaway Breaks Back In. I'm going to go to something very strange. And Olivia, it's about <laughs> Santa Claus. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, uh, I guess June and January, is that the idea? Well, there's an interesting... Do you mean, <laughs> do you mean December? <laughs> Well, just the kind of theme of like the, you know, the whole they, feeling yeah, of whole winter in Christmas the summer. In July. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, now we're looking at um, a whole period of time where, you know, Santa Claus has been used as an inside code when the astronauts were dealing with the UFO factor. So something very strange came up 
recently in relation to the NORTHCOM uh, commander, and uh, that is General Van Herc. We've gone over his history before, but he had a kind of a public fit, and uh, he was throwing a lot, and I mean a lot of hassle, at Spacecom. And um, it involved who was in charge of the defense of North America and who would arrange for missiles to be sent off and uh, this whole thing. And uh, in the middle of that, I discovered that behind his back, Biden had nominated a new COG NORAD NORTHCOM commander. And um, that is General Gillett. Now, um, it's very interesting because this guy needs to be ratified by the Senate and everything, but he's going to take over. And so suddenly we have Van Herc going off the reservation, basically because I feel that they had prepped him for the UFO threat invasion piece. And now he realizes I'm not, <laughs> I'm going to be passed over for this guy. And this guy coming out of McDill Air Force Base in Florida is very interesting because of the amount of UFO activity around that base. So I'm going to get into him in a different episode, but I want to get to this. NORTHCOM's head, which is Van Herc, sets records straight on missile defense boundaries with SpaceCom. Uh, this came out in Defense One News, picked up by All Domain, this story. After what General Glenn Van Herc called a totally deceiving and incorrect, think of the language here, you're in the military, deceiving and incorrect SpaceCom statement, there was widespread confusion about who is charged with the missile defense mission. Snapshot here. In February, we had all the balloon action. By the way, we recently had another balloon go over Montana, and the Biden administration was like, it's no problem, let it go. <laughs> uh, so they now just you know let balloons of whatever variety just wander across the United States. But um, snapshot that in February, he was the one who came out through NORAD and said, we're shooting down that UFO and um, he was the one who came out and really, you know, was the leader. Now, in the event of the continuity of government program being activated, he, in fact, becomes the leader and sets up regional commanders and regional governors for different parts of the United States. And so all of Congress and all that stuff goes out the window and he secures things <laughs> until there can be another election. Yeah, just like uh, our friend Zelensky said, well, we can't have any elections while the war is going on. Um, so this is how these people operate now. Emergency powers is the name of the game. If you've watched this show, you understand it. So let's go a little further. General Van Herc wants to make it crystal clear that the military's most recent plan laying out war fighting responsibility in no way changes the missile defense related roles of his two commands, U.S. Northern Command, NORTHCOM, and NORAD. They forgot to mention his third command is the continuity of government combatant commander. Following what he told Breaking Defense was an incredibly misleading announcement from U.S. Space Command. Now, you never see this kind of a battle go hit headlines. So with him being replaced uh, and the, the emphasis that I've put on the COG NORTHCOM commander and their role in the UFO file threat means that these things are coming into position. So a lot of this tension that you're seeing that you wouldn't ordinarily get is kind of like, you know, having a Supreme Court justice say, you know, give me the Kennedy assassination files or something, you know, it's this out of character thing that doesn't make any sense. Van Herc pulled no punches in expressing frustration over Spacecom's statement about the revisions of the United Command Plan signed in April by President Biden that reassigned some of the missile defense support functions previously owned by uh, STRATCOM. So it goes on and goes on. And then... Um, he says, when you have somebody from Space Command saying, we've owned missile warning missions since Space Command stood up, it's totally deceiving and incorrect. So the, the rhetoric here is, is very hardcore. So he says, in my NORAD hat, I'm th uh, responsible for providing a threat assessment of threats in North America. And I'm also responsible for an attack assessment of where the potential threat missile would be going, such as Washington, D.C., Denver, Colorado. Now, um, further on in this article, it gets, it gets even more intriguing, if that wasn't crazy enough. And he says, in my NORTHCOM, uh, days after its announcement, SpaceCom 2 sought to clarify the confusion. And they went into a whole thing saying, hey, you know, 
we do we do control it and he is full of it basically so uh real heavy duty public back and forth so down here we have uh, van herk now says this without space command doing that I don't have the domain awareness and the ability to execute my missile defense mission or my threat warning mission. I'm comfortable where the department has landed with Space Command as the sensor manager and the one that's going to provide advocacy on behalf of everyone who has equities in missile defense around the globe. Now, um, what's interesting is he, he talks all about who gets this war fighting role and who has the responsibility for these different things. But then he goes off the reservation and in the uh, in the final aspect of this article, and bear with me on this, another Northcom official elaborated that Spacecom satellites hone in on Rudolph's red nose with infrared satellites and big radar on the ground. Then Van Herk noted that his Santa tracking mission is in many ways a good example of how Northcom, NORAD, and Spacecom work together to ensure U.S. leaders have global situational awareness as santa goes around the globe space command provides domain awareness to me to track santa and provide warnings to all the kids around there of where santa is and what time he's going to show up at their house mm -hmm. now uh this whole track is very interesting <laughs> and we're gonna just reflect on the santa language here now I'm going to show you several cases where Santa Claus is used and known to be used. And insiders have come out and said that NASA uses Santa Claus as uh, the astronaut lingo for when they're seeing a UFO and they need to, to deal with it. So they'll start saying something about Santa. So in fact, if you read between the lines on what Van Herc is saying, he's saying, I'm the one who tracks the UFO threat. And I'm the one who tells you when they're going to be in such and such a place, get Spacecom out of my UFO threat domain. Now, uh, I don't know what the thing about Rudolph was, but that's interesting. What has changed, officials of both commands explained, is that Spacecom is now providing other types of supporting capabilities that were previously in Stratcom's bailiwick and that enable warfighters in charge of missile defense systems to do their job. Now, um, if we go back on this a little bit, back in time, unknown on big screen, NORAD says it's Santa. This is an early UFO report in NORAD using this Santa language, saying, oh, no, it's just Santa. You know, don't worry about it. Colorado Springs, the deadly serious business of scanning the northern skies for hostile aircraft will take on a happy note again this Christmas Eve. For the eighth year in a row, NORAD Air Defense Command will keep American and Canadian kids posted on the progress of Santa Claus as he journeys southward from the North Pole. This is way back in the late 50s that this article came out. Now, um, the reason that they started to do this whole Santa connection, they made up a reason for uh, tracking Santa through NORAD. And it had to do with an ad, a strange ad that was placed um, in the New York Times, it was supposed to be a Sears ad. And the idea was, hey, kids, call me. I'm Santa, you know, and it's all this stuff. I went back and actually got the ad and <laughs> visit me in Toyland. Now, uh, Santa Claus is there. And the, the excuse now for NORAD getting involved in all this is supposedly on this ad where it says me too, that's supposedly NORAD's number. And oh, by accident, they placed it that way. And guess what? they called the NORAD desk and they had all these kids calling NORAD desk saying, can I speak to Santa? That's supposedly the story of how they got it going on. Um, so the original kind of uh, explanation for this was always weird anyway and, and highly unlikely. Now, now we're going to talk about Donna Hare. Donna Hare is a former NASA employee who got... Uh, basically hassled very heavily because she saw that they were airbrushing UFOs out of classic NASA photos. So uh, she tells her story and it's quite interesting because there's a Santa Claus section in it that is absolutely riveting. And um, so I'll give you a little background here. 
She said three flying saucers were spotted on the moon during NASA's lunar landings. And in video testimony, Donna Hare says the space agency covered up a series of UFO sightings that they codenamed Santa Claus. Hare claims she was told by numerous sources, which she does not name, about three UFOs that landed shortly after one of the moon landings. By the way, there's a lot of corroboration for uh, her story through other channels <laughs> and also uh, even intercepted communications of the Apollo missions. You know, they, they're talking about this among themselves. Now, she talks about another contractor and says that he was bullied into silence. And um, she says that this man was in quarantine with them and was part of their debriefing. He said a lot of them talked about their experience of these crafts following them. That is the astronauts who landed on the moon. I believe there were three of them on the moon when they landed. And I, they said the code word for them was Santa Claus. Harris says she's told most of her friends and family, but has not received uh, backlash from officials. They didn't threaten to kill me, but I got the message. I shouldn't talk about it. Um, and that's her. She worked um, in their photography and imaging centers for uh, a good long time. So um, her background checks out. Now, a little more on her. Uh, there was something about, yes, there's something about the other contractor there, which is, what she says, they didn't threaten to kill me, but I got the message. I shouldn't talk about it, she explains. But I'd already talked so much about it, it didn't really matter anymore. And like I said, at the 1997 congressional briefings, I really started feeling like this topic was like sex. You know, everybody knew about it, but nobody talked about it in mixed company. <laughs> this is very strange. NASA has yet to respond about the claims. Hare isn't the only one who claims they've seen pictures of UFOs while working at NASA. Sergeant Carl Wolf, who worked for the director of as a uh, director of intelligence, worked for the director of intelligence at headquarters Tactical Air Command, claims he also saw photos being altered to omit anomalies on the moon's surface, actual um, structures. Wolf went on to an area at Langley Air Force Base where he was given a reel of images to view. He claims he saw 35 millimeter strips of film which were spliced together to make 18 and a half inch and 11 inch mosaics of the lunar surface for release to the general public. An officer told him that there was a moon base made by aliens on the dark side of the moon and it was their job to airbrush them out. Now, um, that guy's claims have been around for a long time. He's rock solid. If you look into his history, he was there and he gave uh, the video testimony um, so that it, it, you know, it's, it's been captured very well. Hers is interesting because of the Santa Claus aspect. And I've heard this for a long time, but let's go deeper with Santa. Ho, ho, ho. In a transcript of Gemini 7 mission, the astronauts mention a bogey, which ufologists have claimed was a reference to a UFO. Uh, Oberg, based on his trajectory analysis of the mission, describes the astronaut's comment about a bogey. Uh, and so they go into this analysis. The astronaut who made the comments, Frank Borman, later conform, confirmed that what he saw, uh, and he offered to go on the television show Unsolved Mysteries to clarify. And so within the UFO community, stories have spread that Neil Armstrong was reported to have witnessed multiple UFOs during Apollo 11. Now, this bogey thing, I have a bogey at nine o'clock, is what you hear on these over and over again. It means I'm seeing one of these <laughs> UFOs come in to our vision. What are we supposed to do? So they're looking for instructions. Um, and then there's a whole thing about in 1968, before we went to the moon with the first major orbit around the moon, you have these guys saying, here comes Santa Claus. Santa Claus is coming in again. And so you have this uh, Santa Claus reference going all the way back to the 60s. When we get around uh, NORTHCOM, you know, him flipping out and saying all these things about SpaceCom, and then he starts going off about Santa Claus and how he's in charge of how to warn about Santa Claus and tell the kids when the threat of Santa Claus showing up and this whole thing. That's pure UFO language. And um, this is Van Herc basically being very <laughs> upset that they're taking away the UFO file threat program from him, which they are, and replacing it uh, with this new general, Gillett. And Gillett um, is very interesting in his own way because, you know, if we look at it now, remember that uh, he 
Van Herc was only installed in 2020. That's pretty, that's like less than three years turnaround. They don't do that with COG commanders and they retired the other one early, the one that he took over for. So either they're not satisfied with his performance during the whole balloon shoot down episode. I'm not sure what it is, but replacing him is very unusual. Van Herc is, you know, a, not in retirement age. So it's very unusual. Um, the, the Santa Claus piece, I think, is interesting because there's a long history of that. And for him to know enough to put that out there in the middle of it, you know, he, he can sort of talk it down and just be like, oh, I was talking about Santa Tracker. But if you really go through and parse through those sentences, you can see him directly talking about the UFO threat. And we have to remember um, that there's another thing with Van Herc which is when they were at the press conference during the Chinese balloon shoot down. And then he said, I'm shooting down UFOs in Canada. They used the term UFO one. And two, the other piece that was interesting is that the woman who was in the audience was Helene Cooper and Helene Cooper. There's two odd things about her. One is that she asked him the question, is this extraterrestrials? And he said, I'm not willing to say what it is right now instantly creating all these headlines that you know general says it could be et so he knew that um and he let it go he should have easily said you know we're just tracking this balloon or whatever but he wanted the et thing to be in there so it's really interesting because helene uh, cooper is the one who worked with leslie kane on the article which launched the false elizondo ttsa false disclosure cia program through the new york times article she is very interesting has a brother who is the mayor of a town in montana where all of these et programs have been started like in the university they have et understanding and all this weird stuff and whenever we're seeing this whole balloon uh you know anomaly thing come in they're always coming in over montana so try to put those two together as we get along and remembering that van herk now is the COG commander who in the event of a UFO threat, as I said, would have absolute power as the combatant commander. This is the thing that they've brought us to. I'm going to have some very interesting comments about COG directly um, from Professor Scott that I've noted here. And I think it's important for us to keep them in mind because they're a crucial aspect of how the breakaway aspect has operated. And X-Protect is sitting right there in that corridor between the aerospace uh, defense contractors and the intelligence agency. And in the middle of all that, you have a number of corporations that service and may as well be part of the government, but technically aren't like Lockheed Martin and Boeing, for example. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show deep, deep tonight here on the UFO file wars. This is the breakaway breaks back in. Is there a group? that has been operating with secret technology and siphoning off billions of dollars and trillions of dollars over the course of decades, developing an entirely advanced revolutionary technology uh, found in the UFO file. And have they been able to checkmate the government in order to do this so that the people who serve in those functions come out pretty much as puppets uh, and dealing and doing the bidding for this group. We're going to find out tonight. We're also going to be delving into a little bit of that history, giving us how the Rockefellers and their original studies into this factor in so strongly. In the second part of tonight's show, we're going to be taking your questions. And before we go any further, I'm going to check the temperature out there with Miss Olivia. How are we um, doing? Great. David Tormina said, Santa's sleigh is definitely an anti-gravity -gra device after all. <laughs> and Space Ghost says, is Van Herc X-Share moving out of X-Protect? Well, you know, I think it's hard. Whoever gets into the position, the thing that they're going to want the COG commander to do, you have to, and this is actually a good question because it's going to give us a chance Let's live in their heads for about 60 seconds here. If you're the COG commander, you're prepared in your mind to activate continuity of government where you become the supreme commander, the constitution goes out the window, the presidency and the Congress goes away, and you have to decide who gets by, who lives, who dies, 
and um, you know who's what region of America is going to be under martial law, who's going to be in charge of that, and you're going to coordinate reports. You're going to take your underground bunker, you know, pressing buttons down there, and you're going to have complete run of the world above. And then uh, you know the nuclear question, the deeper technologies that they've hidden come into question. And maybe the whole planning for an entire future without this version of the human race, et cetera. That's the mentality that he has to be trained in in order to provide the function of COG commander. They have to find somebody with the psychological powers to be able to handle a situation like that. Now, um, when we get into the heads of the breakaway X-Protect people, in their minds, they're thinking, Ultimately, it's important for them to keep that UFO secret because even though it's great and to their advantage, they go beyond that in their minds and think of themselves as these ultimate good guys because they're the ones who are protecting society. They're the ones who won't give the technology to our enemies. They're the ones who deserve. They're the ones who are the elite who deserve to be able to keep this uh, secret from humanity. And they've been studying it and, you know, they're the ace scientists and military and finance people. And uh, they consider themselves the elite group. Now, we get a real crossover with them in the World Economic Forum people. These are all interlocking groups. And they do, uh, as you can see, even with the NORTHCOM squabble with Van Herc and SpaceCom, you can see where the power struggles are <laughs> and that can get pretty ugly and uh you know we might we might see a lot more of that but we have to remember where these people are coming from if we're in their heads even a little bit we have to get a glimpse of the kind of insanity that it can go off a cliff into so even if you're starting off with someone who is a fundamentally sound military officer once you put them in a role like this the very role itself uh, can lead to a number of psychological uh, distortions and there's a kind of a almost a psycho spiritual aspect to it as well because um there's there's this aspect of playing god that i think someone in van herck's position gets into and uh we see this a lot it's something that president kennedy warned about and he was around these people and they were constantly giving him advice about what to do against Russia and the kind of righteousness that they had and him thinking, oh, you know, this is the amazing thing. Like they think if we go in there and bomb all these Russian missiles in Cuba, that they're telling me that the Russians aren't going to do anything. It's ridiculous. The Russians are going to launch against us. We're going to have to launch against them. They're going to create nuclear war, but there's not going to be any of us around after the fact of them doing it to tell them that they were wrong. <laughs> so, um, we have to keep all these things in mind that we've we've engaged these types of psychological uh, forces before. And the deep state is a, is a psychology. And remember, at the deepest point of the Central Intelligence Agency, the motto is, there is no truth. So they make truth, whatever the truth is. There's no objective truth. There's the truth that they make. It's whatever they say it is. It is. That's why you get... Phony Oswald can, you know, shoot <laughs> and cause seven wounds in eight seconds and all that nonsense. It's because, well, they make reality. So um, don't trust your own senses. You know, 9-11, the passports come flying out of the airplane and the FBI guy picks them off off of the ground. They're just inventing things to make their ops work and for people to buy into it. And um, the only reason they can get away with it is because you have... Um, and you see this even when you get into the independent media, but in the mainstream media, you just have this, instead of being the guard dogs of the populace, you get the whole poodle aspect, right? They're being poodles to the establishment, kissing up. And you see it, I think there should be, when it comes to um, around the, what we've seen with the UFO file, it would be very beneficial to uh, really line up what is a poodle interview versus what is a guard dog interview. <laughs> so, you know, all this stuff with Colehard and Grush and all that, that's all, you know, I'm scared. You're the one who has to lead <laughs> us out of this. And that's all poodle stuff. George Knapp kissing up to Elizondo and, and, you know, like you're a real hero, man. You know, that's, those aren't interviews. They're, um, it's like a weird 
mutual admiration society that and it doesn't lend itself to journalism it lends itself to a a kind of a back and forth ping pong of admiration what's interesting though is um it's by design because the the watchdogs are you know when you ask the right questions like take the bobby kennedy thing that he's going through right now every time he sits down they're like you're anti-science, you're anti-this, you're anti because he's raised the questions. You see, that's the, he becomes a heretic, you know, dark journalist becomes a heretic. Uh, you know, if they're going to do major operations to censor Bobby Kennedy, you know, why should I expect the things that I do to be any different, right? On this level that I'm doing it on. So this is the nature of uh, where we find ourselves in the middle of all this. So if you really look at it, watch the things that come out and ask yourself, you know, with all the fluff that they have, like Corbell and all that nonsense, are those poodle interviews or are they guard dog interviews? <laughs> and I've always said any of those, you know, people who are doing the op, you know, like Graves and Elizondo or Grush, they're welcome to come on this show and have a gentleman's debate anytime, but it's going to be a watchdog uh, interview. And so they'll never come on because I'll ask real questions and their op will fall apart because I'll show that they're still connected to the government. And they never left the government. And that's why they're damn afraid of dark journalists, <laughs> right? Everyone you're watching the dark journalist show, uh, we're deep, deep tonight in the UFO file wars and the breakaway breaks. And we're going to be taking your questions in part two. I have a little section here, um, that goes, runs deep on, something very strange about how they set up the financing about the breakaways. So I'm going to get into that before I do Miss Olivia Europe. WC Ray says, hope Daniel can score an interview with Bobby Ray Inman. And could Daniel discuss the Bobby Ray connection with Mark Richards? Well, uh, I've got a huge section on Bobby Ray right here. I put him in the thumbnail for a reason. Uh, and Bobby Ray Inman is such a key personality in all of this. He's 93 now. And, um, looking incredible, by the way, yeah, he, he does. He, uh, he's kept very good care of himself. There are all kinds of interesting crisscrosses with Inman, uh, from him giving the CIA lifetime achievement award to George Joannides, who is the person who was the secret architect of the Oswald psychological operation. It was the chief, uh, CIA psychological operations um, person who no one even knew anything about, even when in fact they demanded that we get all these JFK records, they didn't know who Joe and Nittis was. So they couldn't put that in the whole batch of what it was, but it was figured out by a former Washington post, um, reporter named Jefferson Morley. And boy, you know, he, he came up with some very interesting things about Joe and Nittis, but there's Inman in the eighties, the late eighties talking to researchers like Timothy good. And I have some of his quotes tonight. But some of the things that he's saying is like, yes, you know, we do know what's in those crap. We we have looked at them and we do know who's operating them too. Really big statements for someone who was a former NSA director, deputy NSA, uh, deputy CIA director. And um, this is someone who also hung out with John Warner, uh, Senator Warner, who is the father of John Warner, who comes on this program, John W. Warner IV. And, you know, when, when Warner was growing up and stuff, he was around all the time. So there's, <laughs> there's a weird thread uh, in all this. And I actually think that Inman is somebody who, if you put him under oath, could give you deep, deep answers. That's why Tim Burchett, you know, in a way, like, forget about the Grush sideshow, take the testimony, but don't sit there. You know, and Tim Burchett is the congressman from Tennessee who's saying that he's going to do hearings on the, the UFO issue. I have some really interesting stories on that here, too. But um, one of the interesting things about what Burchett is saying, you know, is I want to get to the bottom of it. Well, look, if Burchett sits there during the congressional ter testimony and it's just like, wow, you mean we got a dead alien pilots? You know, it's not going to do anything for anybody. It's going to be a weird sideshow. And, you know, like Huffington Post is going to be like, Congressional testimony about dead pilots its just not going to get anywhere. It's going to be weird headlines for all these people to just go in circles over. And um, what I suggest instead is that they take someone like Inman and put him under oath if they want to get to the bottom of the UFO technology curve from when he was in there. And remember, when he left the government, he went into SAIC, 
well, boy, they're known for developing <laughs> unusual and alternative technology as well. Um, and I don't think that this has to be, it's not like, a, you know, this is a guy maybe who gets an opportunity to volunteer to do this, you know, uh, and he has a lot of secrets there to share. Inman um, shows up in the heart of the UFO file. Whenever you're looking, you're going to find his presence around there in the 70s and 80s, including that big attempt at disclosure uh, in the 80s. I think that Inman was trying to be a piece of that. There was another uh, force driving that, and it was Lawrence Rockefeller. And Lawrence Rockefeller was one of these people who was sort of, you could call him a breakaway from the Rockefeller family because he wanted to bring the UFO piece to the table as well. Now, um, what I want to get at with Bobby Inman is that previous researchers like Stanton Friedman thought the real deep intelligence around the UFO file was with Inman. So here's just a couple of things around that. Stanton Friedman, a nuclear space systems researcher, uh, he's written a book about UFOs, believes that Admiral Inman, this is an article from the late 80s, holds the secrets to a cosmic Watergate, massive cover-up of a flying saucer crash in Roswell, New Mexico. A researcher from the U.S. Senator for, uh, U.S. Center for Military History in Washington yesterday confirmed that the government has been obsessively secret about objects crashing in the New Mexico desert. Yeah, you think? So they developed uh, Exprotect as a means of safeguarding the technology aspect. Now, if we go into the heart of the X series, there's a piece here that I want to keep us to keep in mind as we go through the regular research and crisscross them, which is apothium, which is something that doesn't get mentioned in any of the traditional UFO research. Uh, I've given the name apothium to all these strange effects that we hear about in relation to the UFO file. One of them is walking through walls. Uh, so when the abductions happen, people walk through walls. So all sense of physical matter disappears. Then time disappears. So you have time and matter disappear. Uh, so the effect of the UFO technology has this effect. It has a number of other effects. It shuts down power plants. Uh, you know, it prevents plants from growing. Um, you know, there, there's just a number of things. And there were some stories that came out recently of some of these people who were spilling their guts since they heard that there was going to be a congressional hearing. And one of them was a contractor who said, you know, we found a craft that was small and when we went inside it, it was huge. This is, you know, there's a big reference in Alice in Wonderland to this state of dimension, dimensionality. So we need to kind of have that type of thinking on, I think, as opposed to a straight military type of approach. And what they've tried to do in drumming up the threat, which is totally different and it has nothing to do with the reality of the thing that we're talking about. The UFO threat aspect is so crucial to them that they, they need to apply all of this military hype and threat and all the rest of it to it. So they need to keep us in that little box when we think about it. But apothium opens up a much more likely scenario, which is the effect of the uh, technology itself is unpredictable. And because it is actually a kind of altered... Uh, reality destroying physics. So all the physical rules, the universal laws that we know and understand go out the window when these things show up. Now, uh, apothium isn't just something that you get from the UFO file. It is the X technology creates the same effects. So a lot of the things that Tesla is working on, for example, you will find gigantic uh, crisscross with that and the time travel technology that um, Thomas Townsend Brown was developing and some of the strange things that are described. I talked with members of his family, including his daughter who worked on the technology. So she, you know, she was very aware of how it operated. And uh, she talked extensively about Townsend Brown demonstrating his acoustic fan for big military uh, figures like Curtis LeMay in the sixties in the basement of Rand corporation, the classic defense contractor. And then suddenly acoustic fan disappears. 
she's sent off to Europe and he's told to hush up and he disappears down to Nassau. Uh, and Nassau is a very interesting location <laughs> to go. So this is very interesting the way that these things work because that is the aspect I think that can open up this whole thing to us. Not, oh, you know, Grush saw an alien or actually he didn't see it. He just thinks that someone else heard about it. <laughs> you know, th th that's not going to get anybody anywhere. That's not the real thing. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to uh, create the context where they can roll out the advanced technology that they've been hoarding here for decades in a way and provide an explanation for it that makes them heroic somehow instead of showing the nature of the harvesting that they've been doing um, while completely lying to the public and also using the public's money to create a huge infrastructure for this stuff underground and in space. It's a, it's a scandal beyond a scandal. And this is the nature of why the breakaways need to break uh, back in and make a profit, but they need the rest of that history to be wiped out and eliminated, including their assassination of President Kennedy. That's the kind of history. And those are the types of congressional hearings that we can really make some progress with. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist show deep here tonight on the UFO file wars. And uh, we're going to, and the rise of Expertech. We'll take your questions in part two. Let's go a little further since I mentioned, uh, I've got a lot on Inman, so we'll go back to him. But I mentioned Lawrence Rockefeller there. Um, there's the classic picture of Hillary and Bill. It's in the background there somewhere. Um, he's probably hitting on the photographer. But a bing <laughs> <laughs> uh, And Lawrence Rockefeller, and the book that Hillary has in her hands is the book that he's given her and that book is called are we alone and um she is strolling along there in wyoming that's uh 1995 and lawrence rockefeller is known as the airspace tycoon because while the other brothers were deep into oil this guy concentrated on aerospace his deep fascination was the ufo file and he funded things he funded people like mac uh, there was some you know he got the greer thing off the ground and all the rest of it and a lot of people were like well he's a rockefeller you know but he he was outside of the family and he what's interesting is i found him meeting with president kennedy in 1961 so this is how deep this guy went um but there was a need there uh in his mind for government disclosure and at a certain point he said to the two of them if you can't make it happen i'll do it myself through my own initiatives but he he was actually very trusting of them which turned out to be a big mistake <laughs> as it were but um i do think that the rockefeller aspect in this needs to be understood so we get a handle on it so in 1955 through 1959 they launched something called the Special Studies Project. And they had Henry Kissinger and a bunch of different um, you know, scientists and social scientists and all the rest of it. And they were going into, you know, how can we study the culture and figure out what's going on and how to maximize it and all the rest. And so a series of books came out about this. But the study that they did on the UFO file, they kept locked up at... Um, the archives and for the Rockefeller archives and our friend David Rockefeller kept it under lock and key all this time, uh, along with some unusual references I'm going to show here tonight. This is called the prospect for America, the Rockefeller panel reports. And um, so remember the concept that we've rolled out in this series of stealth archives, the stealth archive is something that comes out that you know about, that you hear about, like the JFK files, but you can't actually see it. You just know that it's there. <laughs> well, uh, one of the things that they developed with Prospect for America was the UFO development from 56 to 59. Now, the person who Kissinger was working on it with was Dr. Eric Walker, and he's going to come up here in a few minutes, but mark the name. Uh, as I was doing the research on Rockefeller, I came across Miss Olivia, what I call time traveling Nixon. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> now, remember that John D. Rockefeller died in 1937. And this picture I'm about to show you is from 1918. But 
does that not look like Richard Nixon right next to him? It's extraordinary. <laughs> Take a good look. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it oh amazing? God. Especially from the eyes. I was blown away. Uh, it is. I mean, have a look. So maybe it's a foreshadowing and it certainly is not Nixon because, you know, Nixon was born around then. But how weird is that? All right. Time traveling Nixon. There you go. All right. Um, now. The president of Penn University, Dr. Eric Walker, admitted he was read into the United States government's crash retrieval program when he was on Wright Patterson's Air Force Base Research and Development Board. Following telephone interview took place August 30th, 1987, between William Steinman, Stanton Friedman, and Dr. Eric Walker, former president of Penn State, electrical engineer on the Research and Development Board at Wright Patterson while Dr. Walker was at Hilton Head, South Carolina, summer residence. Now, it's interesting. Um, Steinman is somebody I've pointed out. His book that he did, we did a big show on Aztec last week. We got great uh, response from everybody on it. Let me tell you, I have more to come on that. And um, I understand that the Ramses are working on a third book. So we're going to get both of them on here as soon as that book is ready. Because the research that they did opens up so much around Expertech and the hidden aspects on the UFO file. By going deep into the case, they found the tentacles. And the case had been so covered up that even in the UFO circles, it was like, oh, that's some hoax that happened a long time ago. <laughs> the implications of that case are actually a, a lot deeper than the Roswell case. Although I should mention the two go hand in hand. Um, so Steinman had a tendency. He, he just recently passed away but he had a tendency to bluster in <laughs> and really kind of go for it with these people. Like, you know, did you hide aliens? Like, were you hiding the technology? How do I get access to it now? This kind of stuff. But uh, a few people took his approach as refreshing. And one of them was Robert Sarbarker, this top physicist who confirmed, yes, there was a UFO file, Vandiver Bush was in charge of it, and so on. So even for people who don't buy MJ-12 and all the rest of it, it's on the record that Sarbarker and Walker uh, mentioned this. Just a few of the comments from Walker are interesting. He's not as open as Sarbarker. And I'm going to read something of Sarbarker's right after this. Steinman. Um, this is William Steinman. And he said, uh, there was, you attended a Wright-Patterson Air Force Base meeting around 1950 concerning the military recovery of flying saucers in the body of the occupants bodies of the occupants. Dr. Robert Sarbarker related this to me. You and Sarbarker were both consultants to Wright Patterson in 1950. And then Walker says, yes, I attended meetings concerning that subject matter. Why do you want to know about it? Steinman, I believe it's a very important subject. After all, we're talking about the actual recovery of a flying saucer spacecraft not built or constructed on this earth. Walker, so what's <laughs> What's there to get all excited about? What's the concern? Steinman, I'm not excited. I'm just very concerned. Here we are talking about a subject that the U.S. government officially denies, even going to the extent of actually debunking the evidence. Um, Dr. Vandiver Bush and Dr. Bronk and others thought it was very important and were concerned enough to classify the subject above top secret. In fact, it's the most classified subject in the U.S. government. Walker, yes, I know of MJ-12. I have known of them for 40 years. I believe that you're chasing after and fighting with windmills. Steinman, why do you say that? Walker, you're delving into an area that you can do absolutely nothing about. So why get involved with it at all? Why get concerned about it? Why don't you just leave it alone and drop it? Forget about it. <laughs> this is a phone conversation. Steinman, I'm not going to drop it. I'm going all the way with this. Walker, then when you find out everything about it, what are you going to do? Steinman, I believe that this entire matter should be brought to the public's attention, that people should know the truth. Walker, it's not worth it. Leave it alone. Steinman, can you remember any of the details pertaining to the recovery operations? Walker, I'm sure that I have notes concerning those meetings at Wright-Patterson. I would have to dig them out and read them in order to jog my memory. Steinman, if I write you a letter, will you please answer? Um... Walker, I might at least keep your letter. I will dig out my notes and will contemplate answering. So what happened was there was a big back and forth 
And uh, eventually there was like some almost like letter in code from Walker that was basically like, leave me alone and leave the subject alone. That was the state of mind. And it's a kind of a paranoid thing, but Walker's giving him something, I think, in that exchange. He's saying to him, I couldn't do anything about it. You can't do anything about it because the force that's operating with it goes way beyond anything that we can do. So you know, this idea that you can bring it to the public, forget it. That's the real nature of the ExProtect issue. That's the real nature of what we're talking about and what the Rockefellers call the Special Studies Project. To finalize the little bit on Walker, there's this. Um, Steinman <laughs> was not known as someone who would leave people alone, so he kept going after him and sending him letters and calls and stuff. And finally he got this. Stop. Don't try to find me. I came on that machine. I will leave May 15th. Ergo, quiet, quiet, quiet. Very strange language he's giving him. Another letter was returned with numerals inscribed on top of various letters throughout. This is the so-called code letter, another piece of documentary evidence. Um, so Walker had a very freaky reaction. Sar Barker, by comparison, was like, I don't know why they're still keeping this secret. This was in 1983 and 84. Now, uh, Sar Barker... What's interesting about Sar Barker is that he was best friends with T.T. Brown, and T.T. Brown was working on the UFO question. He was also developing anti-gravity, and he demonstrated the acoustic fan, uh, which fundamentally is, is, you know, alters time. So the fact that Sar Barker and T.T. Brown were such close friends, and Sar Barker was, who was a student of Einstein's, okay, so we're talking about really the cream of the crop of the UFO scientists. But in the middle of uh, Sar Barker's work, he put together the Dictionary of Electronics and Nuclear Engineering. And what's very interesting is almost within a few years of each other, John G. Trump had put together a book on nuclear engineering and was also a protege of Vannevar Bush. So um, the smoking gun of... Sar Barker and Trump and the UFO file and remembering that Vannevar Bush sent Trump in to get Tesla's paper, I think we're getting to the heart of what they're afraid of when we get into this further. A couple of quick things about Sar Barker um, and why I've stressed him on this program, but with the things coming up, it's crucial to understand people have already come forward about this thing and talked about it. So the myth that Russ Colhart doing the poodle interviews that you are the first person to come forward from the government to say this. No, you've had tons of them. I've, I've counted now 26. There's probably more um, top people. And, you know, Philip Corso <laughs> certainly qualifies on that. And um, there's a lot of, now there's problems around the other whistleblowers they want to bring forward. There's a new article today about that where their backgrounds don't check out. So we might be getting the ex-protect bums rush on whistleblowers here so they can roll this thing out fast. Um, but let's just do this briefly on Sar Barker and bring it around. Sar Barker says, you know what? We, we had the craft and we studied the bodies. Yes, we did that. Like, I'll put that on the record. But, uh, and remember, Sar Barker was like Oppenheimer. He was celebrated on the cover of the New York Times and everything else. Back then, they got rid of them. You can't even find a Wikipedia page now, as I pointed out. Um, but what he said was, you know, the only thing we could figure is that whoever created these aliens were actually making them like insects so they could provide the kind of speed that these craft were flying at. Um, this is another interesting thing that Walker put on the record when he was talking about the Aztec UFO crash, which is what Steinman got in touch with him about. Um, Steinman was trying to figure out well, what about alien bodies and things like that. And he, he said, as far as I knew, they were human bodies and there were four of them. The official, uh, what was able to be digged out by researchers is that there were 16 alien bodies involved in that crash, what they assumed were aliens. And um, so Walker's story is, uh, you know, four humans operating the UFO. Very strange, very strange discrepancy there. This is what Sarbarker gave us. Um, 
many of the people who've come forward, um, well, let me, I'm going to skip ahead on this. Sar Barker was at the Washington Institute of Technology, Oceanographic and Physical Science. Now, it's interesting because um, they've been stressing very much in the UFO field, and they've been changing the name of UAP to anomalous to, so they could include the USO aspect. There's some piece to the threat operation and what they want to do with the UFO threat side that involves the ocean. And this may also be, this ties in directly with something that Mike Gallagher, the congressman, came forward and said that, oh, we're dealing with an ancient civilization, you know, that's coming to get us. He's the one, he's the trial balloon. How far can we push the public's imagination on this? Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, the, you know, we've provided the details heavy on this show for a leftover Atlantean advanced technology. But... I think that the way that these people are doing it, they're playing with the public's imagination without the conviction of the facts behind them. Um, and I, I do want to read that. So I'll read Sarbarker's quote, and then I'll read Gallagher's. How are we doing on time here? Everyone, you're watching UFO File Wars. This is Dark Journalist X Series 153. The breakaway breaks in the rise of Expertech. We're going to take your questions here shortly in about 20 minutes, I would say here, before I go any further. Miss Olivia, you're up. Contiki Man said, stumbled on a Dr. Robert Sarbacher obituary mentioning he was a member of the Cosmos Club. Yes. Uh, oh, well, listen, Cosmos Club, I think we've proved now through several episodes, was UFO Bilderberg, and it still has those aspects built into it. But uh, you have all the major UFO people on the government side going through the Cosmos Club and the highly secretive nature of the thing. It's got a front group and then it has a behind the scenes group. Uh, Contika Man also said, um, did DJ ever connect the Sarbacher Wilbert Smith interview opening with collapsing the magnetosphere to Birkeland's mysterious death in Japan? I don't know about that. Yeah. Um, that is very interesting. And um, there's an episode that we have coming up on the international geophysical year that includes both of them. So that whole thing uh, is, is going to be included in there. So for sure, it is interesting. <laughs> and I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, so we have the actual letter now from Sar Barker to Steinman. And um, this is the only part I think that is crucial. It's a long letter. Relating to my own experiences regarding recovered flying saucers, I had no association with any of the people involved in the recovery. If I had, I would send it to you. Regarding verification that persons you list were involved, I can say this. John von Neumann was definitely involved. Dr. Vanover Bush was definitely involved. And Robert Oppenheimer also. And um, then there's a whole thing about Von Braun. Now, when we go deep uh, into that conversation, what he, what he gives him is his experience from what his own uh, point of view in dealing with it. About the only thing I remember at this time is that certain materials reported to have come from flying saucer crashes were extremely light and very tough. I'm sure our laboratories analyzed them very carefully. There were reports that instruments or people operating these machines were also of very light weight, sufficient to withstand the tremendous deceleration and acceleration associated with their machinery. I remember in talking with some of the people in the office that I got the impression these aliens were constructed like certain insects we have observed on Earth, wherein because of the low mass, the inertial forces involved in operation of these instruments would be quite low. Now, it's interesting, uh, <laughs> I told you that when I met Charlie Fultz from the Allagash incident, he said to me what? He said that the being looked like an insect in spandex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's interesting, we have the insect uh, piece, that's also the conclusion that he's saying that they came to, that these aliens were constructed. He's definitely saying they are, you know, automatons in a sense. Um now, Sarbarker signed off, I still do not know why the high order of classification and have been given 
has been given and why the denial of the existence of this these devices. Now, uh, he was deep in the UFO file and he, you know, had a tendency on a few occasions to do this. Now, an interesting story is that um, Wendell Stevens, who did the book with Bill Steinman, actually um, reported that interesting story about after his conversations with Steinman, Sar Barker, who was actually living up here near Harvard University, got into his car one morning and he called his son at the hospital and said, you know, there was a weird jelly on my car handle and I felt weird when I opened the door and then, um, you know, that built up over like 10 minutes and I drove to the hospital and he died, he would die in the hospital there after this getting this weird effect and this weird jelly. So they didn't want him around <laughs> spilling his guts. They probably tapped the phone of Stan Friedman and Steinman. So my guess is they just had to get him out of the picture quickly there at the end. His best friend, as we remember, T.T. T. Brown, a couple of weird things here. And we have to keep this in mind when we look uh, and, and also my conversations with members of his family. When we look at the UFO file and we think of T.T. T. Brown, well, that's him demonstrating the acoustic fan for Rand. This thing would completely disappear along with T.T. T. Brown's research. The government just was like, oh, <laughs> this is it. Um, and there are weird stories of how they tried to remarket some of his discoveries that were from this deep level into consumer items later. Very interesting story. But the thing um, that his daughter told me was that when he was in the hospital dying, that um, Hal Putoff had come to visit him and was pressuring him to, for about a particular device. Now, the story is quite extraordinary, and I realize that, but the device supposedly is something that he got from a UFO. And it's something that she basically described that looked like a large iPhone. And uh, she knew that Putoff was pressuring him on his deathbed to get access to this thing. And he took her aside because her, they had been incredible confidants and she had been his lab assistant and all this stuff. And he said, do you see him referring to Putoff? And he said, never, ever deal with him. Ever. <laughs> so... Um, now, she told me that, you know, and it, I think it tells us a lot about what's going on here with the UFO file is that certain people who are claiming to be big liberators and disclosure people should not have any access to any of this stuff. In my opinion, Brown was one of the biggest ex-share people. And, um, you know, so I think that through, probably through uh, the various programs of put off working for the CIA for this and for that, that that whole institution just corrupted uh, a researcher like him. Now, I don't know why Brown said it. There's no, she didn't give me the deeper explanation, but whatever it was, you know, uh, he, one, he didn't want Brown didn't want put off to have this device. And two, he didn't want the daughter to ever deal with put off. I think that's pretty serious. Now it's interesting because um, the remote viewing program is so fascinating and so many good people have come out of it but put off was associated with it very early on they've put him through you know all kinds of different things and he showed up in the middle of ttsa and all the rest of it so um but i think that there's some you know something to be said there for understanding the depth of somebody on their deathbed warning about other people um, that tells me that there's something dark underlying the disclosure aspect in one hand and that those scientists are, who are doing it are not thinking of the larger ramifications of what they're engaging in. They're just out for, you know, the advantage. And that's where we get the X protect. That's where we get the breakaway piece. And now those groups are trying to take that advanced technology and figure out a way to bring that back in to the public line. Uh, everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show. It's UFO File Wars and the breakaway breaks in. I want to remind you, if you haven't already, to go to the darkjournalist.com website and sign up for our newsletter that keeps us in touch. It's a free newsletter, but um, it'll let you know the incredible shows that we have coming up for you, X-Series episodes, interviews you won't believe. 
incredible things set up for the summer documentaries and of course events coming up for you. It's all in there in the newsletter. Um, and considering all of the incredible censorship that we've seen, and like I said, we're used to it, but, um, you know, the thing is at a certain point <laughs> you realize the real pipeline from the dark journalist show to you guys is directly through that newsletter, much better than any notifications, but you know, we'll use uh, everything we can as far as social media networks to get the word out. Um, the other thing I want to mention is, uh, you know, there is going to be some very important uh, events and things that come up. And so we're going to announce them to those people on the newsletter list first. Okay, Miss Olivia, before I go any um, further. Space Ghost said, where is Howard Hughes in all of this? Well, we've designed uh, the documentary about X-Protect around Hughes, including uh, having an interview with Bruce Morgan, who was Yvonne DiCarlo's son. And um, he put some very interesting things on the record about the level of knowledge that Howard Hughes had about UFOs. And uh, if you go around that realm of things, you're going to find also that Hughes had seen this is the thing about the early navigators hughes Lindbergh. they all knew the ufo file inside and out because they were flying side by side with that stuff gordon cooper talking about the food fighters and all that um he said oh yeah you know like <laughs> the things were known to fly in formation and they would kind of imitate the actions of the planes and uh you know so the people who were up there they understand this it's much more you know, it's kind of like um, when you get people who see the corruption of Hollywood Boulevard or something who are there, you know, versus somebody coming in and being like, well, you know, these are the demographics of um, Hollywood Boulevard. The people who live in it understand it. You know, it's their block. Just like in Dallas, everyone understood, oh, LBJ was involved in <laughs> with the CIA and Kennedy's death. You know, it's in the neighborhood. They understand how things work down there. So when people are operating in the skies, these things are there. You know, they see them. So it's just part of their reality. And we hear stories and we hear, you know, sometimes fantastic stories about things. So it, it's all a, a believability scale at that point. But um, for them, it's just part of the nature of the gig that they're doing. Astronauts, you know, ask yourself, do you think that there's no briefing about aliens when you go to be an astronaut? <laughs> uh, no, it's there. It certainly is there. And uh, I think they've given hints of it. As a matter of fact, I think with some of them, keeping that knowledge warped them a little bit, you know, and guys, I think like Aldrin, who had a lot of things to put on the record, but there's, there's a kind of altering of these people so that they don't, have the full capability you know it's almost like if they try to get the words out things get strange and i think edgar mitchell has some of this too you know he goes into space and he comes back and he starts all these meditation academies and, and things of this nature you understand the, the light switches on i think um when you're dealing with the extraterrestrial neighborhood as it were um what else you got <laughs> i'll go into the deep end Frank uh, says, will we meet real aliens on a mass scale in our lifetime? Um, it's a good question. You know, I think the that's one. I, I think the, the problem is that um, they want us to get us. AI is trying to learn how we would respond to something like that. And they're trying to ramp it up quickly about how our responses would go. You know, they've been studying us for 20 years on social media and for years before that through all kinds of programs, including advertising programs that came in the mail and things like that. They have all of these different ways of analyzing trends. And um, anyone who studies marketing understands how intelligence works because the way you break groups off is into different grids. And you, you know, you have the main, um, sort of vertical grid and then you have the horizontal grids in between it and so when they lay out <laughs> when they roll out um things around the ufo file and the ufo threat you can peg how they do the horizontals you know it's like 
okay, they're trying to appeal to this group here by suggesting this and this and this. And over here, you know, they're splitting off and they're trying to appeal to the, the people who are somewhat skeptical, you know, and they analyze and the AI that they're using now analyzes how we would respond to certain things. So uh, I feel that they've developed a program for us to meet false aliens, the, the ones that they've conjured up. <laughs> and I think the real thing is totally different. And that's the nature of the problem. And, um, you know, so we get into an interesting question, which is in your lifetime, will you see the false UFO threat with the false UFO aliens? Yes. <laughs> During your lifetime, will you see the real thing? <laughs> That's a different question, but it is a good question. Um, all right. I Here's the freaky, styly one of the day. You ready? Um, two things I'm going to squeeze together in one piece here. The GOP congressman suggests UFOs may be ancient civilization. How does that relate to Mike Pompeo? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to show you. Um, okay. That GOP congressman with the weird <laughs> alien-like picture. Look at this picture. That's Newsweek. Mm. I swear to God, all these shows are becoming the X series now. <laughs> this is amazing. Right before our very eyes. Um, so here's Gallagher. And <laughs> this is the other thing I was thinking. Like Gallagher, uh, GOP congressman suggests UFOs may be ancient civilization. Well, I guess if this guy does a congressional hearing, he's going to have to call me. <laughs> All right. Republican congressman has suggested that unidentified flying objects could be ancient civilization. Republican congressman uh, Mike Gallagher has suggested UFOs could be an ancient civilization that's hiding on Earth but has only just begun to show itself. Gallagher is a representative for Wisconsin, chair of the House Committee on the Chinese Communist Party, discussed various theories about the potential origins of alien sightings. Uh, on Pat McAfee's show there, he spoke about the ongoing efforts of Congress to investigate claims the government may be in possession of technology, not from this world. <laughs> okay. Gee, Donald Kehoe told you that in 1957. Ooh, Newsweek is breaking the story. House Oversight Committee Chair James Comer announced an investigation into allegations at the beginning of June. The alien probe, can you believe that they did that? was launched after various claims were made publicly by David Grush, a 36-year-old Air Force veteran who had just come out of the NRO. By the way, the most secretive thing that we have out there, except for X-Protect inside of the CIA, is the NRO, which no one even knew existed for 30 years. Now, what exists now that we don't know exists at a federal level? Ask yourself the question. So the breakaway group, they're doing just fine. <laughs> they have the cover of, hey, you know, it's 30 years later, we'll announce that we were here the whole time operating this UFO file. But anyway, back to Gallagher. Um, he discussed various theories about the potential origins of alien sightings. And uh, appearing on the sports talk show, Gallagher suggested that one possible explanation is supposed UFO sightings was the so-called Terminator theory based on the film of the same name, that aliens were actually human beings from the future. Another hypothesis, he said, was that as opposed to being us from the future, it could actually be an ancient civilization that's just been hiding here and is suddenly showing itself. Whew, boy, are they covering the bases. I mean, are they covering the bases? This sounds like it could be, you know, the interview could be uh, DJ and Farrell, right? So they're catching up. They're catching up. Gallagher said the worst case scenario would be if the reported sightings of craft that appear to defy modern capabilities were actually advanced technology built by adversarial nations. It's Russia. Um, so this is pretty interesting. Um, speaking about the investigations into the UFO claims, the congressman echoed remarks on Monday by GOP Senator of Florida, Marco Rubio, who said those coming forward to give testimony have held very high clearances within the government, but were fearful of their jobs for speaking out publicly. Oh, uh, look, Rubio's a neocon. <laughs> Rubio wants to bomb Iran. That's what he ran his presidential platform on. Mm. He's given uh, millions of dollars by defense contractors. This is not anyone who's interested in UFOs because, you know, uh, 
for any <laughs> altruistic reason. What's interesting too is a number of these people coming forward have heard something in the background and everyone is trying to be on the front of that UAP, UFO defense train because they've heard all the money that's coming. Now I want you to um, look back and see when the internet really got uh, rolling. So 1994 was the public. I mean, they had ARPANET and all that other stuff all the way back to the late 60s. And that was part of COG, by the way. So the internet that we're using is actual COG tech. What's interesting is Windows 95 came out and it became the kind of thing that everybody could use. And it ended up saving, you know, the Clinton administration, which if you look at the records, 93 and 94, they were the worst rated administration in history and they were on their way out. And um, he lost both houses of Congress for the first time in 50 years to the Republicans because he was doing so terrible. And they found him getting $300 haircuts <laughs> and all kinds of stuff back then. So, um, you know, he picked his fights poorly and Clinton was just getting whacked around. And then the internet came along and made him look like a hero. But if you think about it, all the innovations around it that they got later, like the smartphone and all these other things to connect up. And these are the things that were supposed to do so much for our society and certainly have the potential for that. But think of all the different companies that grew out of it. Think about how people could sack their jobs and, you know, they could, uh, do all any kind of tech job and make 10 times as much money and you know set their own hours and all this other stuff so all kinds of things happened as an innovation around it uh, creative destruction businesses changed etc now the breakaways bringing in the breakaway technology what does that do it's going to bring in all those factors now the the right now the ukraine war is an incredible uh boon for all these different types of companies and not just military um you know, people who actually make the missiles and things, but all the things that are associated with it, all those companies are doing great. These people know how to get these different things going. And with the UAP UFO threat piece, the breakaways can bring on a revolution that'll make the internet revolution look like a joke um, because they have the technology. It is that advanced and they can create all of these industries and become so financially overstimulating that um, you know, we're going to need, <laughs> we'll probably need a secondary planetary economy in order to handle it. So I want you to think about that when you hear about these people who you've never heard of being even vaguely interested in the UFO thing, suddenly coming out and saying, oh, we need the truth from that government. You know, even though I am the government, let's get that government to give me the truth. So they've been whispered to in the background, look, you're going to be on the front line of this thing, but you have to bring it to the public in a way the public will accept it. And here are the terms. The thing is advanced. It's a threat. And, um, you know, only the government can roll it out responsibly. Now this ties into something that came up, which is if you've been watching around the Grush thing, some weird things have been happening in the background. One of them is that uh, Arrow, which is the UFO Defense Office, UFO DOE, which was put together by Rubio, the neocon, and Senator from New York, Kirsten Gillibrand, who's there with him, Republican and Democrat, working together. Hey, bipartisanship at last. These people work together to place the UFO Defense Office on the National Defense Authorization Act, which meant a trillion dollars in military funding could not go forward unless they attach the UFO defense office and they got away with it. Now, these are the same people that are pretending they want disclosure, this and disclosure that, but in the background, what they're preparing is a gigantic financial uh, boom explosion for them. And they are, are becoming the front people and the people they're picking out to rep this. And I've pointed out some of them, uh, Ruben Galejo is another one is a congressman in Arizona running for Senator and Nancy Pelosi is there um, campaigning for him over uh, Kristen Cinema, who was a Democrat who's become an independent. But it's very rare for Nancy to step out <laughs> as, since she retired and do this. So um, all of these people that are associating themselves very heavily, you know, we've seen people out of government, formerly uh, in the government. Um, Chris Mellon, 
you know, all of that thing. It's all part of a uh, Intel track, which is related directly to this aerospace push around the breakaway technology. What they're trying to do is create the train tracks that this thing, when it comes in, will be so overwhelming and will command so much attention and anchor uh, a completely new economy with completely new technology that no one will be able to question anything about what they've done with it. And they also plan uh, as the way to roll it out, to roll it out via a threat so that they can say, well, yeah, it's a good thing that we put together this development program. I'm going to show you how they're going to do this. Um, and it was a sneaky little article that came out um, and was noted by a number of defense-oriented publications and some bloggers too. And then I'm going to mention Space 1999. Are you All ready right. for that? <laughs> Get on your sci-fi, classic sci-fi <laughs> hat. Buried in the Senate's approved text of the Intelligence Authorization Act, IAA, for fiscal 2024. And remember, this is how they're doing it. NDAA is how they got the UFO Defense Office, the UAP Task Force, all of that uh, dovetailed into Arrow, the creating the uh, All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Now, that piece that they did with Arrow was accomplished through Gillibrand, whose father-in-law was the head of British Aerospace, one, and whose husband was the lawyer for Nexium, which is the disgraced Keith Rainier sex cult. And what she got called out on the floor on when she ran for president in 2020 didn't go so well. So you have to remember who you're operating with. The other thing is um, Rubio, supposedly because of his own background that he hasn't owned up to, um, has a number of things in his closet. And so he's one of the most blackmailable uh, members of the Senate, supposedly, along with Gillibrand over here with Nexium. So you have people who have a lot to lose fronting this thing. Let's go a little bit further. Buried in the Senate's approved text of the Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal 2024 are inclusions that would direct deeper transparency regarding government encounters with unidentified anomalous phenomena and any associated attempts made to date to inspect or reverse engineer recovered unexplained craft or materials. Now I'll go through this, but basically and essentially what the article says is in that statute, what they're going to do is anyone who's been associated with the government dealing with the UFO file who might have some piece of it, some piece of a UFO that they have a timeline to turn it in or they get arrested. Now, what they're going to do, in my opinion, is they're going to extend this out to the public and they're going to say, you know, the first thing they do is gather in their <laughs> group of contractors and government people and they're saying, turn it all of your UFO research. The next thing, you go to the public. If somebody out there, you know, if, if a craft went down somewhere in New Hampshire and someone got a piece of it or whatever, you know, then you're on the, the target board. And they don't want people going into this because they no longer want people involved, independent researchers involved in this. They want to take over and trademark the UFO file, which is incredibly dangerous. Now we've seen it in the you know the fluff sense. We've seen it with them trying to market and copyright takeover. Like, you know, when you'd see the dumb TTSA thing everywhere is the terrible black and white tic tac, which you know all that stuff is fraudulent in my opinion. But all the media loved it and they pushed it, and you could never get a picture of a UFO anymore because they had that stupid tic tac uh, thing, which is a complete diversion and was not honest footage but it came out of the Elizondo CIA. They created the whole thing. Now, what they're going to do, and you can see it with the Corbell stuff, whenever they show you know, on these Fox News or whatever, always in the corner, they're like, see Corbell. <laughs> so that they're going to have, you know, where, for example, uh, Corbell's always getting stuff from the military, right? So, And he's always able to copyright it because it's like, hey, they leaked it to me. Now, Apparently, nobody who's an independent person has ever leaked anything to him. So it all comes through the military, and it's all copywritten. You think that might be part of a dry run for how they're going to do this? So when you get into photographs or photos, uh, videos, and all the rest of it, it's all going to be subject to this copyright trademark thing. We own the UFO thing. It's our intellectual property. 
this is the danger of the breakaways coming back in, but they have to do it this way because they're operating on the same kind of monopoly vision that Rockefeller had in the first place. You have to keep that in mind when you're dealing with all this talk about UFO disclosure. And by the way, the entire line of defense in the UFO community uh, just, you know, went down on their face thinking, Hey, you know, I, I pop the champagne. I'm going to be recognized because I was right, you know, and the CIA is going to give me my dream. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> you know, uh, and you don't want to lead your followers into the lion's mouth of the central intelligence agency. I've studied the CIA. I understand what they do and uh, they're playing an outrageously huge psychological operation on the American public in relation to the UFO file right now. This type of awareness and the kind of conversation we have here in the ideas room going on, this is exactly the thing that can turn it around. A couple more things from that article. Um, but remember, this thing is the uh, Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal 2024. The proposed legislative language included in the annual authorization bill comes just after reports from a former Pentagon official turned whistleblower this is the other thing. I, I don't think that, you know, I mean, is he an obster or is he a whistleblower? I don't know, right? But it obster, since he comes out of being groomed by Elizondo, who was an obster, you know, it's probably an obster. So whistleblower, you know, you don't throw it around lightly. Assange is a whistleblower and he's face down in a prison somewhere about to get, you know, launched into the United States for a kangaroo trial. That's traditionally what we do with whistleblowers, unfortunately. Um, and you know, it's interesting because that case becomes more and more crucial. And one of the things, um, that Bobby Kennedy came out and said is on day one, he'd pardon him. That's important because, uh, fundamentally the right of free speech and the things that we're doing here, um, to bring that journalism out, it can't become somebody's tool, you know, and it can't become something which, uh, every journalist, there's a chilling effect where you fear to publish anything that challenges the government because you'll end up like Assange. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to provide the example, you know, they're back in the neighborhood. <laughs> um, and so, you know, they're trying to give you that example so that you toe the line and uh, don't make me come back here and you should have some kind of an accident going forward. It would be very unfortunate. Okay. No later than 180 days after the IAA's passage, the officials would also need to make all such material and information in a comprehensive list of all non-Earth origin exotic UAP material. So they're saying, they're admitting in this document that they have it, that these contractors have used it, that they've been involved in redeveloping it. Now they're saying, give it all back. And if you're involved in any kind of project like that where you've been using it, then, you know, you have to give it back now. Um, a little further. In the latest version of IA introduced in the Senate last week, lawmakers incorporated a mandate for any person currently or formally under contract with the federal government that has in their possession material or information provided by or derived from the government relating to UAP. Again, UFOs, okay? UAP is nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Restricted and special access programs involve sensitive information, classified, higher security levels, et cetera. So there's a little piece in here that says um, no amount authorized to be appropriated or appropriated by this act or any other act may be obligated or expended directly, indirectly, in part or in whole for, on, or in relation to, or in support of activities involving UAP protected under any form of special access or restricted access limitations. Explanation, you can't make a dime off of any of what you've learned in relation to this one. You can't talk about it, two. And three, anything that you've had in terms of access about it, um, you can't have any further involvement with it. Now, um, then they, they go into incredible detail, and I will actually take some time out. But the thing I wanted to point out is that they say, if you've been working on this, you can't take part in 
the development of propulsion technology or aerospace craft that uses propulsion technology systems or subsystems that's based on or derived from or inspired by inspection analysis of reverse engineering of recovered unidentified anomalous phenomena craft or materials. Translation. If you have been working on a UFO redevelopment project and you go off on your own and you're working independently with a corporation and in creating this thing, we're saying you can't do that, that we own it. And anything that you've worked on or think that you've worked on has nothing to do with what you're doing. You're under the rules of if you, it doesn't matter if you've inherited the material, if you've worked in a project about it, Basically, we own the trademark on UFOs. That is how the breakaway breaks back in, is they gather up all the little pieces and they say, we're the boss now. Now we can roll it out because we're the total monopoly and you guys don't have anything. Um, which is, of course, absurd because they developed it all, one, with our money. <laughs> Two, they created a whole space infrastructure because we gave them NASA as the cover or whatever. And three, they've developed an entirely different uh, group, the ex-protect group, and have interfered in public policy. They've assassinated high officials, including presidents, all to hide their advantage, secrecy, the wall of secrecy of the UFO file. And that includes finance, politics, science, aerospace, the works. And it's all there in black and white in their own documents. <laughs> Everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show. This is X series episode 153, and it's a special UFO file wars breakaway breaks in. We're going deep here uh, with you. And uh, what I'm going to do, I have more to get to on this, but I won't wait any more to okay, get to your questions. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you a question I've never really asked you, Okay, which is, um, you know, it's do a, I dream of aliens? Yeah, no, <laughs> it's that an last incredibly week. clever um meticulous plan. What do you think about it? I mean, other than just being sort of outraged by the injustice of it and everything, but actually, I mean, is there, there part of you that sort of respects the the effort that's gone into this? You know, how many people, how many moving parts? It's it's incredibly meticulous. Oh, no question. It's an excellent question. Um, you know, I've been studying it from a lot of different angles. And um, I think there have been people in earnest who try to study it in a straight ahead scientific fashion. And they got so far with it. And uh, I was, you know, it, it was great to see their progress with it, but it was always dissatisfying because it was like someone else always held <laughs> um, the real truth and they could only get so far. And the only way they could get any further was through the assistance of someone in that structure, like an intelligence person who could lie to them. So you'd always be going around in circles. But um, what's interesting to me is how much it's influenced politics, geopolitics, wars, and um, in such an invisible fashion that they've been able to pull these things off without us ever thinking about it because the general public would never think, oh, that's related to UFOs. It just doesn't, it doesn't occur to them. Now they'll start to shape people to think, oh, there's a UFO geopolitics because they're going to include this threat thing and they'll get you to think about it. But up to now, they've been able to kind of walk invisibly in this path. This is what they've been able to do. And, um, they've operated in such a fashion that we haven't been able to see their footsteps. Uh, so yes, I would say I have been, the, the amount of stealth that's involved there would almost make you think that they had a, an alien technology because you would instantly say to yourself, how have they been able to pull this off? And it is only through the knowledge of, the mystery schools and the esoteric side of things that you can unravel the thinking that's involved. You can get so far on the deep state analysis. You can get so far on the scientific analysis, but if you don't understand where the weather vane is in relation to their belief systems and the kind of things that they can conjure uh, literally and 
metaphorically, then it becomes a much harder thing to investigate. You know, I hear uh, once in a while you hear people <laughs> and you listen to them and you feel bad who are deep on the UFO thing. They've been like, they've been one of these guys who, you know, for 30 years has been cracking away at it. And I've listened to them and, you know, they'll say something like, we need to get the truth from that government or whatever. And then, you know, it'll be blue skies from there because they'll have to admit this and they'll have to admit that. And we'll get it. We'll make the CIA give us that. And it reminds me of this thing I brought up about Michael Schallenberger a couple of weeks ago and him saying, you know, oh, all these intelligence people. As soon as I mentioned that um, I was doing the UFO thing about crush and all that, all these intelligence people came to me and they told me all about the crashes. And he was like, you know, the American people can go to these different facilities and force them to open. And I've learned about 12 different alien crashes, you know? So it's the incredible naivete that bothers me the most when you, when you get around it, because those people are never going to give you anything. You know, their, their, their whole training program is about lying. <laughs> And the reason that they lie is because the entire institute of the Central Intelligence Agency is extra constitutional. And it was set up as an extra constitutional thing through a very clever legal mechanism. So much so that it doesn't have any accountability to the rule of law. As a matter of fact, one of the great things that Professor Scott discovered, and really, you know, What's fascinating is all the research is in Professor Scott's work. No, he doesn't talk about the UFO file, but if you take his deep state research and you apply it to the UFO field, you'll the, all of the things start to open up. But um, the thing that he found out was that there was a statute that came up because uh, there was a group involved around the CIA at the same time called the Office of Policy Coordination, OPC, and they would do the really hardcore things about rigging elections, blowing up trains and, you know, all kinds of covert activities and paramilitary activities. And so much so that it freaked out first uh, Truman and Eisenhower. But Truman said, you have to, to the CIA, get that thing under control. But what happened was uh, over in Thailand, there was a, an OPC agent who was running a drug trade and there was a CIA guy over there observing him doing this. And he was sending back reports and he was about to expose his entire network and the OPC guy assassinated him. So you have OPC assassinating CIA. And um, in the middle of all that, you know, Truman said, you have to basically get them under control and pull them under control. Apparently what happened was that OPC took over the CIA <laughs> because they were the ones with the power in the first place. And that the original CIA was meant and set up to give information, you know, informational intelligence like the OSS. This OPC factor is what we're talking about. It is the actual CIA now. And it has been for many years. That's the thing that disturbed President Kennedy was that they were their own government and they weren't accountable any longer to the president that <laughs> he spent three and a half years trying to get that power back. Now it's interesting. Um, when we think about the whole thing there about what took place is the person who committed the act of killing the CIA agent, the OPC agent who killed the CIA agent set up the rules and the leadership of CIA because this had happened that anyone who was uh, observing a crime or was involved in a crime from the CIA side could not be prosecuted for uh, not, you know, coming clean about it or, or, you know, observing the crime. In other words, the OPC agent got away with killing the CIA agent because they built in a clause that said no one in the CIA can be accountable. And since you're OPC, you're technically under the CIA. So that applied to them across the board, and it is a statute that's built into their program. So the CIA is beyond the reach of the law because of their own clause. That's how extra constitutional the government is. That's all in Professor Scott's research. It's sitting there. But um, when you apply it to the advanced technology field and the whole piece around how we got into this situation, 
I have pointed out those rules in relation to the domination uh, of aerospace because it is the intelligence groups with the aerospace groups that are running uh, the situation on the ground. And, you know, basically that interface that's been going on that Professor Scott calls the deep state that we're referring here to the breakaway and you hear, you know, the expert tech group right in the middle of it. You know, there have been other names for this thing, but basically this is the nature of the invisible structure that we come up against over and over again. Yes. Susan Blackstone wanted to correct me and say, uh, she said, not meticulous, diabolical. And I would agree with that. Uh, (laughs) Michael Lewandowski says, DJ, do you think the aliens could be controlling the U.S. government and other governments? Uh, I think it's. I think it should be looked at what um, type of communication has taken place. There's too many stories about working together in some fashion. And uh, I've pointed out before that even Stanton Friedman, who was a very, you know, he was a deep UFO researcher and he was on this program um, and we had many conversations, but he himself was someone who believed in the possibility that Eisenhower had met with aliens. That's pretty remarkable if you think about it. Um, let's, um, I want to include this little thing about how space 1999, when it started, the first episode was all about them setting up a moon base in 1999. It came out in 1971, but the first episode was called breakaway. And I just want to get around the term for a moment here because um the term showed up in during the cold war and it had to do with breakaway republics and it had been around kicked around before as well but the idea was you know that the soviet union was one major block and then one republic would split off and split away and historically you can find that as well you know breakaway republic broke away from rome and things of this nature and just getting into that headset about what that means and what that is. Um, so let's just get into this early history of Space 1999. Everyone, you're watching UFO File Wars. This is X Series 153. The breakaway breaks back in. Uh, okay, so they have the Meta Probe, and it has a large array of solar panels. It's the only craft in the series to feature them. The etymology of the name Meta is from the Greek after, beyond or change. In Roman chariot races, the meta was a column that marked the turning point of the chariots. I think that's very important for our, uh, you know, using that as we're at kind of one of those meta turning points as well. Um, Magnetic radiation is an odd but not illogical term for magnetic fields. In the 1980s, it was proposed that magnetic fields created by high voltage electricity were associated with cancers and psychological issues. It's very interesting that um, whenever you get around the study of UFOs, it is people who are deep on the magnetic side uh, and studying the magnetics of it and the reverse magnetics, that whole magnetic propulsion aspect that seem to be deeply clued in, seem to be deeply associated with the research as if the key inside the apothium, the UFO file, and all the rest of it is magnetic, just like ley lines, just like all the things around the earth are magnetic. Um, There's something relating to magnetism when you get around the UFO field, much more important than just thinking, you know, oh, about the speeds of the thing or whatever. How do they operate, in fact? Um, So here's one of those examples. In an effort to hold the USSR together, Gorbachev first attempted military crackdowns on republics declaring independence, but he quickly changed strategies and announced incentives instead. Um, Gorbachev reached an agreement with a number of the breakaway republics. So this is how it operates. It's the term is a good term in that sense. And, um, Now, it's interesting because Kit Green was a CIA scientist, and he supposedly floated the term about a breakaway civilization to Richard Dolan, who picked it up in his book, and that's a Melinda Leslie story. And then Farrell took the whole concept further down the road 
And uh, he had a, a couple of different books related to breakaway civilization, incorporating the secret financial systems um, from Yamashita's gold and, and things of this nature. So uh, I think what we can do in looking at this is say that there's there's been a number of steps along the way for putting together a picture of how this other structure operates. And when Professor Scott refers to the deep state you know, he's gone into detail with me about what the different levels are. And I'll just touch on those briefly, but basically, um, you know, organized crime functioned on the lower level of the deep state, the intelligence agencies controlling and interfacing with organized crime. That's the part that comes out in the JFK research a lot. And you hear about, you know, the CIA was using this mafia group and things of that nature and all the rest. The thing that's missing when we get around the JFK assassination is the aerospace piece. JFK set off on the moon landing. <laughs> he bolstered NASA. He wanted to share the UFO file with the Russians. Um, you know, as we've pointed out in this program, E. Howard Hunt, the top CIA spy, admitted to the Watergate lawyer, Douglas Caddy. Kennedy was assassinated over the UFO file. You have to, to get a handle on the history of this thing, it's important to keep those factors in mind. Now, here's a weird story, and I'll just hold off on your next question for a minute, but I'll get right to them, Miss Olivia. Mm -hmm. And thank you for being gracious. Um, and remember this one. There's a strange bearer bond story that comes up in relation to Kennedy, and it might give us a hint as to how this structure operates financially. Mystery of fake bonds fuels web theories. Um, we have to go back maybe about a decade for this one. But New York Times even covered it. It was such a strange story. Italy's financial police seized U.S. bonds worth $134.5 billion dollars from two Japanese nationals on the border between Italy and Switzerland. They included 249 U.S. Federal Reserve bonds worth $500 million ETH each, plus 10 Kennedy bonds. Now, when they busted open their suitcases, they found these false bottoms, which had all of these. Uh, and Customs did this. And maybe they got tipped off. But they had these Kennedy Billion dollar bear bonds. And uh, in the back of those bear bonds was the moon landing. So it's really interesting. Officially, the government never put out any bear bonds with Kennedy on it, and certainly nothing about the moon landing. But here we had $134 billion in these two gentlemen's suitcase. Is coming into Switzerland, obviously, to switch the money out. So somebody was going to pay on these. And they wouldn't just be walking around. It wasn't an art project. <laughs> and the guys were arrested. Um, Italian authorities have not yet determined whether they are real or fake. But if they are real, the attempt to take them into Switzerland would be the largest financial smuggling operation in history. If they are fake, the matter would be much more mind-boggling because of the quality of counterfeit work is such that fake bonds are indistinguishable from the real bonds. Another story, strange inconsistencies in the $134 billion uh, bearer bond story. Now, uh, one other thing. Though the smugglers have been identified in the press as Japanese nationals, there has yet to be any confirmation, uh, confirmation if the smugglers were indeed Japanese or some other ethnicity. How difficult is it to confirm the ethnicity of the smugglers, and why is this information being kept secret? According to a brief Bloomberg article regarding the story, the seized bearer bonds allegedly were dated as of 1934, um, the non-Kennedy ones. Since bearer bonds and denominations of 500 million did not exist in 1934, the bonds were originally deduced as fake, though the Italian police are still waiting for a declaration regarding the bond's authenticity. 
So, and this, you know, you get right to Farrell, which is Farrell citing the Bloomberg article. Uh, and in Dr. Farrell's work, it was the secret system of finance is how you're able to accommodate all these covert programs because the covert funding aspect is so crucial. Well, that takes us into the things that we've discussed on this show re regarding the missing trillions and regarding the money that has disappeared from the government. How do you fund this invisible structure? Well, they've been able to do that and keep it off the books through the secrecy of the continuity of government program and through the Central Intelligence Agency. They have a secret system of finance and somehow through this freak accident of these guys getting caught 10 years ago with these bonds. But then think of the bonds themselves. What do they represent if they're Kennedy bonds and on the back they show the moon? Do they literally represent some ownership of the moon? And is the Kennedy aspect shown on the front as basically saying this was the person that we got out of the way in order to be able to use this system? Wow. So it's like so, a blood sacrifice. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's actually a perfect way to put it. And so the way I would think about it is um, this breakaway aspect, how have they been operating? And the bear bond story is a clue. It's a key into it. It's a hint of how that's been operating. Everyone you're watching the Dark Journalist show, this is UFO File Wars. Breakaway breaks back in. Uh, it's great to have so many of you here with us. We're going to take a few more of your questions here. And I want to remind you before we go any further, especially if you're new, go to the darkjournalist.com website and sign up for our free newsletter. And that keeps us in touch through the heavy censorship uh, from the stories that we're doing here. And uh, basically you just get it once a week. And, um, you know, <laughs> I want to point that out too. I, there are some things I sign up for and they bomb the base with like, you know, three or four of them a day or so. it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's a drag. It's unbelievable. Uh, and some of them really, you know, supposed to be good <laughs> journalists and everything. Matt Taibbi, I get like four <laughs> things from him a day. It's ridiculous. And uh, that's the end of that. But we, we send you, you know, basically this thing once a week, or if there's something really important going on, you get it twice a week. Um, but all the important things are in there, the incredible shows that we have coming up for you and interviews that will blow your mind this summer, along with the incredible X series uh, episodes we'll be doing for you on these topics and special reports. Also, uh, documentaries and events that are coming up all in the newsletter. All you have to do is sign up for it. And uh, we'll get it to you and make sure that you stand up and be counted for that. Miss Olivia, you're up. Okay, Sacred Forest. DJ, how would the UFO slash breakaway tech play out in the Ukraine war? Did they bait Russia to roll out some exotic weapons against them with UFO as cover? Publicly, there uh, is this play that says the USA has nothing to stop Russian hypersonic weapons. The USA has, quote, failed with their own. Do you think that exotic uh that's exotic weapon confidence that they're eager, eager to use. <laughs> That's a really good question. Well, first of all, on the surface, there's always, you know, those weapons that we hear about, like hypersonic. Um, you know, we hear about this, we hear about advanced nuclear, updated nuclear things. And then there's the other weapons <laughs> that they don't talk about, but that they have. The fact that I've seen, uh, and this is pretty interesting, which is that Russia now has been... Um, saying openly, oh, we saw this UFO, you know, go over one of our depots and uh, we shot it down. We got rid of it, you know, and all in relation to the Ukraine war. For me, they're unmasking the language there. And they're saying, you know, because the Russians, um, if you look at it, are neck and neck with our UFO program. And they have strange... Uh, you know, kind of detours and avenues in it that maybe we haven't explored, but they certainly are at a very high level. And um, maybe we got quite an advantage after World War II with the paperclip aspect. They got their version of not Nazi scientists, but apparently we got the cream of the crop. Um, but theirs are very good too. And so that gives them the jump on the UFO file, their command of space, you know, um, and some of the weird things that went on that I'm going to get into about the International Geophysical Year and Lloyd Berkner. 
I pointed this out in the episodes I've done on Berkner, but I, I want to just say it here. When President Kennedy was assassinated, he was going to meet someone at the trademark and give a speech. And he had a whole preparation set up about a flag that was going to be delivered to this person that had been flying over the White House. Then we learned of a second person who's deep in the UFO file. Well, the first person he was going to meet was deep in the UFO file was Lloyd Berkner, who headed up the Robertson panel. But he was also in charge of the International Geophysical Year. He had been with Admiral Byrd 1929, uh, 1928 through 1930 in Antarctica, setting up radio. So Berkner was such a deep player um, that the person that Kennedy was going to meet when he's being assassinated was Berkner, and Kennedy was going to hand him in the ceremony with the helicopter and everything else a flag that had flown over the White House, and they were going to make, according to Berkner, in his own words now, a statement that would have international implications and basically shock the world. So um, that never happened. So for years, the question came up, what was the speech that he was going to give? And it dogged the Johnson administration because they were supposed to have it. And it didn't get released and didn't get released. And then finally, the Johnson administration made something up. <laughs> and it, you know, it was one of the dumbest speeches about like, hey, we have to use more nukes. Or you know, it wasn't the Kennedy speech. But the actual speech may have been, we're going to the moon together with the Russians. And by the way, I'm sharing this advanced UFO stuff with them. Or if you don't think he would have gone that far, just the admission of the fact that they were going to do a joint space mission, which Sergei, uh, who was Khrushchev's son, has already admitted is true. So you get kind of in the headset, the mindset around these things, and it starts to open up uh, on a different level for us. Now, the other person who uh, Kennedy was going to meet is very interesting because he was also involved deeply in the ufo file and also on the robertson panel and his name was Luis alvarez and kennedy was going to give him a medal for advanced science um he will uh, kennedy will die and he'll get the medal in fact from johnson just a couple months later but it's a very strange hollow kind of a setup and who shows up for it but vannevar bush so there's some something there that took place. And uh, I think that it's significant. And in all the researches that I've done around the UFO file or the JFK assassination, I've never heard it ever mentioned that he was going to meet Lloyd Berkner. Now, here's another weird thing about Berkner, which is Berkner himself dies very strangely. And uh, I've often said about Berkner that he was right between X-Share and X-Protect. He seemed to operate on both levels, but um, there is some kind of X-share thing there. And what happens is he meets up with President Johnson's uh, advisor, and he meets up with um, James McDonald, who was a really major UFO activist. And somehow uh, he had the respect of President Johnson. And maybe Johnson thought... You know, he could use the wedge of the UFO thing against the deep state, um, even while he was giving them everything that they wanted because he was a constant uh, blackmailer. And what's interesting and very strange about this is that they have the meeting. It's recorded in McDonald's notes. They talk about all these things related to the UFO file. They leave. Two weeks later, Berkner goes to Washington, D.C. He's going to give a speech on astronomy or something. He stops at a fast food place, shows up at his speech and dies. So uh, he was 62 years old. So, you know, I mean, pretty young for this. A couple of years later, uh, McDonald, after bringing forward all this important things around the UFO file and trying to counter um, the hearings that they were having in the late 60s, and all the nonsense of the Condon report and all that stuff, which you had these guys in the background who were working deep on the UFO file, developing the technology, you know, learning so much about it. And then the public saying anyone who believed in it was a fruitcake. <laughs> That's just the way that they handled it. 
and everyone, you know, all those scientists were living a double life. And um, then McDonald, you know, shows up in a hospital somewhere and he's all kind of beaten up and they're like, where have you been? His wife shows up and all this stuff and he's blinded because, um, you know, it looks like someone shot him in the eye or something. So then they're like, well, let's just keep him here. We'll rest. We'll come back tomorrow. Well, he takes off and three days later, he's found on the side of a highway and that's the end of him. So, you know, um, I know there are a lot of strange deaths and we've talked about them around the Kennedy assassination. These are some of the weirdest though. Um, so it looks kind of like, you know, the type of thing where there are groups operating to do different things entirely with the government and um, the knowledge of the UFO file. And they seem to be, you know, it's just like when Garrison was investigating the JFK murder, he keeps running into weird aerospace stuff and Nazi stuff and UFO stuff. It's like, <laughs> you know, I thought I was going after a political crime here. What is this stuff? That is very telling. And I don't think all of the knowledge base was available in the sixties to be able to prosecute it properly. And, um, you know, here we are in 2023 and the JFK files are still locked up. <laughs> I mean, it does make you wonder, doesn't it? Uh, yes, Ms. Olivia. Sith Trish, does DJ think that these agencies are so compartmentalized that these, quote, whistleblowers think their stories are really true, but they really aren't? Oh, see, now, <laughs> this is exactly uh, how they would play it. And it's an excellent point, which is it doesn't have to be the individuals involved who are lying. They could easily be fed a series of notes and circumstances, uh, but certainly there, there is lying that goes on in relation to this. But um, yeah, you could easily pick up a whistleblower and you could say to him, hey, did you know, you know we're keeping these craft and all this stuff here? Now, here's what's interesting. They can leak the sensational aspects, but of course the leak has the core of truth in it. And this is the kind of magic of the whole thing, which is... They are, in fact, um, in possession of reverse engineered craft. I don't think there's any doubt about that. They are in possession. You know, the UFO file is real. UFOs are real. <laughs> there's something here operating that's not us. You know, I think that that's pretty clear. Um, I've gone into aspects around ancient technology and Atlantean technology and the aspects there <laughs> and you know long before mike gallagher uh and it's funny with gallagher too because gallagher's lining up everything time travel ancient what, what else has he got hybrids um i wanted to play a clip though and it's i have a video clip of this on twitter uh i, I put it out there a few times i'll i'll put the whole clip out there but it was um John Stossel, and he was talking to Mike Pompeo, who was the CIA director, and Pompeo did something very interesting, which is, um, first of all, he was in the ear of President Trump telling him, assassinate the Iranian leader. You know, he was, he was the serious neocon in Trump's ear. Then, um, when he's, you know, Trump is running for re-election and all that, he turns on Trump and he's like, oh, you know, they should put him in jail for that classified document thing. Or he went, he went and said he should be prosecuted, you know, and all that kind of thing. I don't know if he said he put him in jail, but um, you know, so Pompeo is that kind of sleaze factor in the middle of all this. But uh, while he was director at CIA, he has some interesting things that he says here. Let's see if I can crank up this audio clip right off my phone here, and uh, it's. He's talking about the JFK records, why they're being kept and not released. And the host is just like, what? This is like the worst answer in history. But then he dribbles in the UFO file. And tell me that these things aren't related. Here we go. Uh, and last thing I'll say is there are things that happened 60 years ago that are still important to keep in the vault. There are lots of things that happened that long ago that still are appropriate not to release. Think of names and addresses and families. And, and by the way, there's also no value in them. They, they don't hold the dark secrets that everybody wants to just hold up as the bogeyman. I saw the UFO files too. Uh, we've got bigger problems. Uh, right, America, lots of bigger problems. Just because something is kept secret, why not not go to the darkest corners? But it's a lot of fun. 
fun. I'm happy to go there with you if you'd like. <laughs> I, I'm no expert in this, but it just makes no sense to me that 60 years ago that there are things in there. You oh, sure. Like sure. <laughs> um, so here he is being questioned on why he won't release the why he didn't release the JFK files and why he fought to block them when they were mandated by law. Because, of course, during the, the Trump administration, although he let out some files, this CIA blocked him. And there he is, and he's like, by the way, the UFO file, you know, like, that's no big deal either. But it's interesting because he's pressed there on the JFK files and the UFO thing comes up. There is the kind of psychological opening that I think you see in these people which is the arrogance comes through, but also the connections in their own mind. They know that the JFK assassination is related directly to the UFO file. Yes, Miss Olivia. Uh, Julie Merrington, was LBJ's X letter opened and contents disclosed this week? That's the one. You see, um, now we reported on the X letter just like we reported on the Nixon-Trump relationship. The X letter is a letter that LBJ left behind saying should be opened, you know, 50 years after my death, and he died in 1973. So they were going to open it, and what happened, uh, this is very odd, but after Nixon died, there was a cover story that the X letter was about um, Nixon and that it was just like some Vietnam thing or whatever. All of these presidents, as I've put on the record before, they have a role in disclosure they didn't know when it was going to happen but they all wanted their role in it disclosed for posterity they wanted to be the ones uh there and so in all of these different cases reagan nixon with the time capsule lbj the their role in the ufo file and in many cases they wanted to be the ones disclosing it but in LBJ's case, he said, open this letter in 50 years. And no one knew exactly what it was. So when Nixon died, there was a kind of a false operation of the, the leader of the LBJ library opened the letter and revealed two pages of it, of uh, something like over 50 pages that are in there. But he revealed two pages of it and said, oh, it's government classified Vietnam documents. So we're going to have to reclassify it or whatever. Didn't open the rest of it like LBJ requested it. And then they just brushed it off. Now it's come up. And if some people have become aware of this thing, uh, we, we did a number of shows on it, highlighting it and maybe it got on their radar, but um, now there's this thing kind of kicking around about it. Like where, where is the LBJ X letter? So um, the current status of it is I've written the LBJ library and asked them what the status of the X letter is. And I expect a, a, some kind of normal response to all that, but we'll see what they do. In my opinion, the only reason to put X on that letter one and two to keep it for 50 years is because it contains a very hardcore secret <laughs> relating to the UFO file and that Johnson had placed that there for a reason. The idea that Johnson would hide Vietnam info for 50 years doesn't make any sense. It had to be something that would make him historic and would also be, uh, you know, mind blowingly momentous. You could also think it related somehow to the JFK assassination. Um, whatever it was, it's very strange, the current status of it, that they had this false opening, then they reclassified it. And then they just stop talking about it. So we'll see. Yes. The Cove Channel. Uh, SETI has a... It's a stealth It's a stealth archive okay. in classic sense. Go ahead. Uh, SETI has a bottle of champagne in the fridge to celebrate contact. Why don't they speak up if we have already had contact with UAPs? Um, well, SETI, SETI has always been one of the most kind of ridiculous things. <laughs> because... Um, it's a radio, you know, radio wave thing looking for alien transmissions. They already have information about, uh, UFOs traveling. So the idea that, oh, someday some lonely thing, you know, will send us a signal. Um, a lot of those projects are cover projects for something else. And that's what I've always felt SETI was. Um, so I've never had any 
belief that SETI would bring forth anything interesting. What is interesting is that the observatory at Arecibo was destroyed and that being in the hot zone, that they didn't want it to have the ability to observe whatever was going on there. And the way that they just, you know, very unceremoniously destroyed it, um, that is also very strange. I mean, I just think it's highly suspect. And what's interesting is they said, oh, you know, the wire snap that we're holding it up, they had just replaced them uh, a year ago. So that, that story doesn't wash. Uh, so there was something that they were going to be able to observe with that, that um, whoever was setting it up didn't want them to be able to do that. So I found the whole story very strange. Yes. Merlin, do you think they're trying to root out remaining human resistance to an ongoing alien takeover? <laughs> Look, I'm, I, I'm telling you, right? It certainly feels like some kind of inhuman thing has come in that is so anti-human. But let's take it out of the realm of uh, just a straight up alien thing and just think more in terms of uh, Steiner's version and vision of Aramon and uh, the possession of the human beings would be the easiest uh, way to come in. You know, remember the whole term about walk-ins? <laughs> um, but I think that to think of uh, the alien aspect, there should be awareness around what it is that's going on here. Because take a project like CERN, where it was made for one thing in the public, which was supposedly to find the God particle. And then there were a lot of rumors about the strange occultism going on and then those rumors turned into court cases and then uh, it you know, went further and further and we started to learn weird things about CERN, like it was a sovereign entity that couldn't be sued. You said, and you started to wonder, what is this thing? You know, And remember that the Hadron Collider is, the Large Hadron Collider is the aspect of CERN we're talking about. The actual CERN is just a nuclear research uh, facility. So there's something really odd about CERN. And if you go deep into it, it's the whole idea of contacting other dimensions through the particle acceleration. But the particle acceleration uh, aspect has been studied. You know, I mentioned Vannevar Bush, John Trump, DeGraff, you know, all of those people, the Varian brothers and the Varian brothers came out of the heart of a theosophical colony. And they were under the influence of the scientific ascended master uh with the purple ray and all this stuff. i mean this is where they were coming from and what do they do they go off and start silicon valley you know um so there's there's a lot of hidden aspects around what the technology represents that go far beyond just weren't the guys you know smart putting this stuff together and um i think if we can track back the mystical influences involved on the scientific level, then we start to understand things like CERN. And, you know, as I've pointed out, um, and I've did programs with Gigi Young on the CERN tarot deck. And, you know, she, what she was getting from it was rather dramatic. But if you look through it, it's very advanced. Uh, it's got, you know, Tesla, it's got the UFO file, and so, you know, this is what CERN <laughs> is investing in. They're obviously very conscious of this whole thing. And there were a series of cybernetic um, groups that were like CERN, and there were conferences in the 1940s. And they were doing seances in relation to the development of cybernetics back then. So... Um, you know, if you can use the science and the technology, especially when you are smashing and you're creating the coldest temperature, it's colder than space when you do those CERN experiments um, or hotter than the sun. So, you know, it, it's quite remarkable when you look at it from that level that there's something like a gigantic scientific seance taking place there. 
then it puts us in the right headspace for it. Yes. Michael Lewandowski, um, how do you take over a planet without killing the people you need? Take control of the government and you control the people. Well, that's they live, basically. Yes. And, um, you know, we have to be open to that, too. I mean, they live is pretty inspired and also <laughs> it lends itself to being like Star Wars, you know, almost like an inside project where somebody knew something. But I think it has to be looked at and it has to be looked at without, um, you know, extreme paranoia or anything, but just to see what constitutes the possibility that humanity has been interfered with. Well, I mean, on a large scale, we've been interfered with for a long time, but the accelerated aspect certainly relates to 9-11, doesn't it? And then... You have the financial coup d'etat. That's also another level of consolidation. And then the 2016 election where the press openly loses its mind. And um, for th that whole Trump presidency, which makes Trump transformational, whether people love him or hate him, he, he carries with him... Um, he carries with him basically the key to the schism in the deep state. And this is what caused him so many problems, which is that his uncle was deeply involved in the UFO file and the groups that see him rise, they're not upset about some real estate guy who doesn't play ball with them or whatever. They know that they sitting at the same level when they're dealing with him. And that's a problem. It's the same problem that they have with Bobby Kennedy. Not that I'm saying Bobby Kennedy is some master of the UFO file, but his family was deeply involved. John Kennedy, um, you know, was writing to senators, uh, as a senator, was writing to the Air Force saying, well, you know, are you covering up the UFO thing? That's public. Imagine what was going on behind the scenes. And um, we know that he requested all of the documents related to the UFO file. We've done a number of shows on that. So the UFO file, look for the 2024 election, we're we're coming into it. Like there's no avoiding <laughs> the topic. They're they're going crazy, pumping up whistleblowers, congressional hearings, any kind of circus that they can put on to push this aspect. And um, but from our point of view, we know a few things. We know of Trump's connection through his uncle uh, to the UFO file. And uh, I had something on Trump with that. And we also know um, that, you know, we know the Kennedy aspect. So both aspects are involved. And then you have this weird committee running, you know, brain dead Biden. And who are they? Well, their whole objective seems to be war and war with Russia and, um, you know, forget the Constitution, consolidation. Um, the COVID op, the whole thing. I mean, they are the CBDC. It's a total control system that's in charge there. The only way you get any semblance of anything back is by having a populist candidate assume the presidency, either Bobby Kennedy or uh, Trump. And the thing is that um, when you look at this situation, it's pretty dire. And, you know, I don't say things like that lightly. It's a pretty dire situation in America if we don't. So we're going to have to do it. And um, that is a huge thing. And I know that we get people even in the independent space saying things like, no, it doesn't matter. You know, the presidency, forget it. And, you know, we'll go off and farm locally or something. And I recommend you do farm locally, but I don't recommend that you um, lay off the presidential election because it has to be a major focus because it's a body politic and the president is the head of that body. So it needs to be a unified uh, effort. And that whole thing about the presidential election doesn't matter is just totally wrong. You know, it matters. It could be the most important thing because the uh, presidency is the most important office, most powerful office in the world. So, you know, you can't leave it in the hands of some weird committee that's running someone who has Alzheimer's. You know, it's very incredibly dangerous to slip into total fascist, dystopian totalitarianism, which we are doing.
<laughs> you know, the elevator's going down a little too fast. I want to hit the stop button. Uh, everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. This is UFO File Wars, the breakaways break in. We'll take a couple more of your questions. And I have a couple of Trump things here on the way out uh, as well. Miss Olivia, you're up. Okay. Stephen Huey says, do you think the UFOs are a threat? I'm a tad confused. And Bonnie Meyer says, I do not understand why are UFOs a threat? They could have taken us out when they flew over Phoenix. I think she's talking about the Phoenix lights. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, you know, the whole point is we've pointed out that the CIA is creating a UFO threat. The Dark Journalist Show, <laughs> me, Daniel is Dark Journalist, has been pointing out that the CIA is running a UFO threat to get everyone into a false uh, UFO threat panic in order to activate emergency powers through the continuity of government. So don't be confused about that. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, UFOs represent a huge mystery. They've been studying them deeply at such a level that we can't imagine how far they've come with it. That's why we've put such an emphasis on them breaking back in because with them coming out with a false dialogue, and giving us the false version. You know, it's like getting a false version of Christianity or something, yeah, you know, a false version of the Atlantis story. This is totally false. And it's mimicking, it's aping um, the real thing. You know, that's why I was laughing about Mike Gallagher's comments. You know, it's pretending to be the real thing and that it's, you know, oh, we're really, you know, um, studying, you know, it's, it's like... Uh, they took the literature from the 80s and 90s and they're starting to recycle it. <laughs> but this stuff on the UFO side, if you read the UFO book uh, from 1950 from Frank Scully, you know, most of the things that they're saying now, you know, oh, I, I heard about dead aliens. It's in that book in 1950. That's 70 years ago, you know, 73 years ago. <laughs> I mean, come on. You know, there's nothing new about what they're saying. They're just giving us rehashed stuff that we've already investigated and already put out, and they've been the block on. So um, fundamentally, what you have are the, the UFO researchers. And I want to point out this thing again about poodles and guard dogs <laughs> in journalism, because you're getting all this poodle lightweight stuff so that nobody sits there and asks Grush the right questions, right? So Colehart, you know, Colthart, whatever his name is, sits there and says, I'm scared. And, you know, everyone's watching you and they're thinking to themselves, you know, wow, this is true. You're the first person who said that we have aliens, you know, and it's just, first of all, he's uninformed. And two, it's not a real question, you know? Um, so it, it's imitative. It's not substantive. So it's not potent. It doesn't have the potency. We talk a lot about potency in this show. You put Grush on this program for two minutes, two to two and a half minutes, and the entire off would unravel. Because one, <laughs> I know that he's connected with a government agency that wants to spread a UFO threat narrative. So we would easily break that down. And two, um, when you say you're out of the government, you know, these people are not out of the government. So Elizondo, everyone said he resigned from the government. And I said, no, he's still part of the government. And they said, that's a lie. You know, all of his supporters, which we found out most of them were sock puppet accounts that he hired. And it turned out he had to, as part of the submission of the complaint, admit that he's still contracted. The guy who's still working for the government. So the, these people are working for the government. The whole TTSA thing were government people. They were CIA people. So the, the field around the UFO thing, I think um, the intelligence agencies had decimated any creative thought and inspiration around the UFO field to such a point that they could roll in this joke of a program. But if you have the analysis in the background, you could get people like Elizondo and Grush, especially if they're under oath, and completely demolish their stories quickly. So uh, that you know, I've invited them on this program. I've pointed it out, not for a shouting match, but 
for a gentleman's debate on it. And they know it too. You know, you have guys like Gary Nolan uh, blocking me <laughs> because I asked him, you know, the depth of your relationship with Dr. Fauci, since you keep talking to him online and high-fiving him and telling everyone how great he is. I mean, this is Mengele 2.0, right? And he's your best friend. And you want to be trusted with the UFO file? No way. So, um, you know, that type of analysis is required, whether it's me or somebody else. It, it has to be involved in the conversation. And what you get instead are poodle. You get poodle interviews, and uh, it's a very dangerous thing to let get it, let it get the kind of momentum that they're trying to roll it out with. Um, and for me, it's a disgrace because um, the amount of lying that's taken place, especially from Elizondo, who lied his face off in public, you know, um, and this guy who says a lot of stuff and doesn't back any of it up, and then the interviewer pretending that there's a history there, that he's the first person who's ever said it, when we know that there's, you know, 20, 30, maybe more big intelligence uh, people who've come out over the decades, you know, and they come out all the time, pretty much. So this whole idea, you know, it's a weird... The CIA knows how to ma manipulate media. That's how they overthrow countries. That's their job. They're great at it. Um, so when you're dealing with the UFO, you're dealing with a counterintelligence force that used to be counterintelligence against an outside enemy. That's what their function was. So they would spread stories. Counterintelligence is making your enemy believe something that isn't true, that gets them away from looking at the real thing. That's what counterintelligence is. So when you train people like that and they're good at that, but what happens if you train those people who used to pull that out to other countries as part of their job, and now they're doing it inwards to their own citizens? That's what the UFO threat is all about. They're doing the counterintelligence against us. It's very simple. And I can see their counterintelligence program. I lay it out whenever they reach a point like this. Um, you know, I, I feel the acceleration on their side and at this point, I think they're, you know, for the 2024 election, you know, it's weird because that year of 2024 is so crucial, but this is the setup for it. And we're halfway through 2023. So, you know, <laughs> it's kind of like we're in this crucial wing of the next three to six months are crucial to collapsing that entire thing. Yes. What do you okay. Got? Nancy O'Brien Simpson, but are the real aliens a threat? Oh, <laughs> uh, I think there are real aliens and I think the UFO file is real. I also think there are other aspects involved that we haven't looked at here, um, like the Atlantean technology and like the mystery school maintaining the technology over years. And uh, this is the X technology I'm talking about and this has within it the potential for this apotheum effect, which is, I think, something that goes all the way back to the destruction of Atlantis. And I want to point out something, too, which is in Edgar Casey's readings, he points out the fact, and it's significant, that the two-eye stone, the fire stone, was discovered, aspects of it were discovered, like basically the miniature version of it was discovered in Yucatan and that it was brought to America, to Penn State. And it's interesting because if you go through the roster of Penn State over and over again, you find big, major, heavy-duty people associated with the UFO file, associated with Penn State. And Eric Walker, who we spoke so much about, who that researcher you know, was nagging for details and who was the guy who was the UFO expert that Kissinger used, um, he was the head of Penn State for 12 years. So there's some sort of jump over, in my opinion, from the advanced artifacts, something like the Two-Eye Stone, which, after all, Casey said, ran the Atlantean civilization. So it was some version of it, some leftover emblem of the Firestone that went to the Penn State Museum in the 1930s. 
suddenly you find these guys who are at the top Penn State Museum running the UFO file. Seems to me there's a connection to that. And so we we need to consider it. Also, you know, Casey, Theosophy, Steiner, we're talking about airships and all this stuff and the, the incredible technological abilities, especially Casey, gets into what the Atlanteans had, like no other. But Steiner talked about it too. And um, Besant, Blavatsky, they knew all about the advanced Atlantean technology. That was an important thing for the mystery schools to communicate that to us now, which is back in Atlantis, you had this stuff. And um, for me, that's, that's crucial. So in a way, you have to integrate that with this talk around the UFO file. Otherwise, you get caught up in people just saying, I need UFO disclosure from the government, which you don't, by the way. <laughs> I think that the government should be accountable. But I, don't, I think that the UFO file is something that we can uh, achieve a knowledge about without the government doing anything. The government, in my opinion, doesn't have the right to um, develop an entire ex-protect group, an entirely separate uh, situation using that hijacked uh, technology. And, um, but nonetheless, I still think that we have the ability to access that without them completely. And this is one of the great fallacies of the situation. Okay, we're going to have to go into this. So yeah. Nancy O'Brien Simpson says, why won't he say if they are a threat or not? Very passionately. Lots of question marks at the end of it. And I think this is the thing. This is, this is uh, not- She's a... not, she, no, hold on. She's oh. not listening. You're just not well, listening. I, okay. I, yeah. So you, you don't, you have to, um, you know, stop and focus and listen. The CIA is operating a false- UFO threat. UFOs themselves are totally different thing. And what we've seen of their activity <laughs> has been, they've been operating here for thousands of years. Um, the, you know, if you fire on a UFO, you might be in some trouble. <laughs> so you're going to have to define, you know, if you mean, are they, you know, are UFOs invading or something like that? No, I, that's a CIA myth. So um, it's, it's more about, you know, you, you have to understand that you're being played on that front, first of all, that the UFO threat carries great promise. Look, if I have a threat, if I have the Soviet Union, I have the ability to enlist all kinds of resources. I can get the American taxpayer to give me trillions of dollars to fight a war. Well, you put that as a UFO defense office against UFOs that are here to do God knows what. Well, that's an incredible boon for everyone involved. And, uh, you know, it's the incredible payday for Lockheed Martin, who right now are living the high life because of the Ukraine war. So how much better are they going to live with a UFO threat? No, this is the thing that they're building, but they're also building it because they've developed the emergency powers for it. The emergency power situation and the continuity of government infrastructure, they've developed it for eight decades. They want to cash in. You think they've been building that stuff for nothing? <laughs> uh, in my opinion, they, want, they, they don't have the ability, in my opinion, to win elections anymore. The only way they can do it is through rigging elections. So um, you're going to have to take this information and say, well, what, what are their options, basically? Emergency powers. That's how they can maintain authority through the continuity government program. And then the thing that gives them the ultimate authority is the UFO threat. Yes. Okay. So Troubadour 2 says this is exactly the plot of classic Outer Limits episode, Architects of Fear. A group of scientists try to prevent nuclear war by creating a common enemy to unite humanity and things do not go well. So I think it's really important to bring up, everyone needs to have an understanding of what the end goal is. We just need to remind ah. ourselves. They're not figuring this out. They're not playing this chess game in real time. They, anybody who's worked with law of attraction manifestation uh, knows that what you do is you have a vision and you then you work your way to that vision, right? You need, the end needs to be clear of what you're trying to achieve, right? 
So the end goal is a one world government, right? It's going to be eugenics. It's going to be transhumanism. It's going to be depopulation, which we've already seen, right? So this is where we're headed. The UFO PSYOP is one aspect to get them further along uh, towards the goal. Yeah, but I would say that UFOs, here's the thing, like we talk about with Farrell, it, you could be faking a UFO alien takeover and the real thing shows That's up. That's true, exactly. So the, the UFO thing is real. So the PSYOP part of the UFO piece is what they have adopted. So they know a great deal about it. I think in their own minds, they think they can imitate this thing. But, um, you know, for me, the, the power for them lies in the threat. When you're in emergency powers, uh, just like with COVID, right? What were the actual things? Well, you can't open your business, right? So if I want to consolidate the economy and a bunch of people keep their businesses open and thrive anyway through, you know, the COVID situation, well, then I can't do it. So what do I do? I enact a series of unlawful actions and I have legislatures and, and governments carry them out. As a matter of fact, I don't even go to legislatures. I bypass them completely and I get weird edicts from these governors to do these different things. So we saw it just with Macron in uh, France where he said, I need to raise the retirement age and they couldn't do it in the legislature. And so he just did it, <laughs> you know, like um, I don't have to account for anything. And so that's how you see the situation with Biden when he wanted to win votes. He was like, oh, I'm going to write off student loan debt, uh, you know, and basically it comes back to you, the taxpayer. You're the ones who pay for it in the end. So the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. You know, and Obama is on his yacht <laughs> in Greece with Michelle and he writes this big thing about like how we're being oppressed and all that. It's ridiculous. So that is clown world activity. Um, but yes, in terms of the goal, what they're doing, you outlined it incredibly well. The thing is too, um, there may be factors that we have keys from hints from in the mystery schools. Um, for example, there's a big thread about earth changes inside of the mystery school information. This is major. You don't hear this talked about in relation to what's going on, but it's crucial. If those people are aware that a pole shift is coming, then a lot of the things that we regard, you know, they're not going to let us in on it with them. <laughs> this is their turn to, um, you know, set up the bunkers and go for a disaster situation, which leaves them on top. And, you know, in the meantime, all the people who are questioning them, the peasants, <laughs> uh, you know, get vanquished and they become the ruling elite into this new world order. Um, so, you know, there's, there's an aspect of that too. There's a delusional thinking point that they have in there, but we've been, the mystery schools, that knowledge base has been shared with us. It's been rolled out, you know, and the thing, part of it is us catching the message about it, which is, Look in uh, the Gurdjieff work about societal collapse. Steiner talking about the future and how the, the battle with Aramon through technology. Casey talking about the earth changes, land sinking, but also land rising. Um, these are things that don't get into the conversation enough when we're dealing around these things, but they're crucial. And on their side, you know, we know that they're into depopulation because look what they just did with the COVID op. It's massive depopulation. And it looked like a quota program as well. Uh, tons of unanswered questions there and tons of false defenses and people who should be in prison, obviously. So when we look at it and we, th we think about the situation and we say to ourselves, well, we can deduce that they're into control biometric control, uh, depopulation, and they're into controlling thought because the less and less that people think, the more and more they're in authority. Um, that's very much like you know, the foundations of 1984. He gives us some thread right there. Um, but there are other aspects that don't get talked about enough in this. And part of it, I would say, uh, the earth changes thing, is very important. 
Yes, Miss Olivia. The Buddhas of Boston Sports. Do you think any UFOs will appear over any 4th of July celebrations? Good time for a deep state distraction. <laughs> um, you know, I've had some interesting conversations about how they would roll this stuff out. And um, sport events, I think, is, is certainly a powerful thing. What's interesting is sometimes on the show, I go back to a series of discussions I had with a group called the Transcenders. And um, this all came about because this NORAD officer um, sent out these press releases about a prediction he had that there was going to be a massive sighting over New York City in, on October 13th, 2010. And I remember looking at it and thinking, this is really interesting going out on a limb like this. And then it happened. And then I actually got in touch with the NORAD officer and um, Stan Fulham was the guy's name. He gave some interviews. There's some people who are aware of what he put out there. And uh, I was going to interview him and I was working, I was doing a lifestyle magazine <laughs> at the time, totally different stuff and uh, technology and everything else. And he died, well, I think within a month of that prediction. And then I was like, oh, that's not good, you know, and we're left in the lurch. How did this guy know? Then it turned out that there was a the psychic source, the transcenders who were giving him that information. And uh, my own conversations with the, that group, it was actually a channeled group through a single person named Rick Thurston. And I, over the course of six months, I had a number, uh, I have about 14 hours of conversation with him. And then he died and pretty young. He was pretty young. He was in this, well, I think he was 55 and, you know, Stan Fulham was in his eighties. So, you know, it was kind of more understandable, but this was weird. After a very short period of time, these two people involved in this hardcore uh, UFO prediction that comes true. And you know what? I've talked to UFO researcher after UFO researcher, and I mean the top people in the field. They don't know anything about Stan Fulham, and they don't seem to be interested, which is weird. That's also like a weird thing of like, oh, forget about that and forget about this story, you know. Um, so there's something odd about that. But in any case, the transcenders, their impression, what they were trying to say is that there was a group there was a benevolent group of aliens uh, that they referred to as Pleiadians who were fixing the environment and who is part of what they were doing because I believe that we have done a certain amount of destruction to the environment. I, I don't think, you know... It sounds I, undeniable. Yeah, and I don't think that this is something just because it's used as a political football, it's something that we have to deny on our side and say, no, everything's fine with the environment. No, the corporations have destroyed it. And therefore, we can go back to the corporations and say, you know all that money you're keeping in offshore accounts? We're going to take a big slice of it to rebuild the economy. How does that, how does that grab you? Uh, rebuild the environment. So um, in any sense, the transcenders, their message was so interesting. They had such a knowledge around this that I think it could be useful for us to take another look at them. Uh, and I may, I may do a show in July just on the chance because they also seem to predict COVID in there uh, remarkably. So, but the idea was we were going to be seeing these things. And so the governments, which have kept the knowledge of these things away from the people um, and have been engaged in kind of hostilities that, um, the governments were struggling with how to keep knowledge of this thing away from us so we didn't know about it. And I think that's why they're giving us the phony version of it. Because um, these things apparently are going to be involved in this project here. And then, I mean, that's just one aspect of the whole thing. But nonetheless, I find it interesting. Uh, that could certainly be an answer, but I'm open to a number of of different answers. I never like to become too completely um, fixated on one idea relating to this extra 
uh, you know, Casey refers often to unseen forces <laughs> and talking about how we're surrounded by them. He also talks about elementals, you know, um, so we're dealing all the time with something else that's operational and, um, you know, there's a whole spiritual aspect relating to that too. But I want to go back to this, which is the people who were originally flying around in World War II and saw the Foo Fighters and things, they weren't subject to a lot of propaganda around UFOs, et cetera. So therefore, I don't buy into things that, oh, UFOs were always a psyop and it was just like a government plan or whatever. Because the Foo Fighters and things like that, you know, they were around. It could very well be that once the government got to a certain level of understanding things about the UFO file, that they thought, how can we utilize this in the public's imagination in relation to it? Those types of operations we certainly see in action. And with that, Miss Olivia, the last question of the evening. Okay, I'm going to pair these two together. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Lyle Kenimer, DJ, do you think we are already in a civil war and how long till it blows up completely and community guidelines? Could DJ please elaborate on what Gurdjieff wrote about societal collapse? Wow, life is real only then when I am. This is a Gurdjieff line. Um, if you study the Bennett work, he extracts... I think the best because he worked with both of them. So he also worked with a lot of intentional communities and set them up. And I think that that work was very advanced and maybe ahead of its time to a point where 50 years later, uh, it, it actually seems more <laughs> timely right now. And um, there was too much splintering, I think, going on in the 60s and 70s when you had communes and things getting set up because they had the drug issue and they had the Vietnam thing and all that. Um, so they had their own, you know, in a way, Vietnam is kind of like the COVID thing, if you think about it. Um, but the intentional communities that Bennett was setting up, like Coombe Springs and Sherborne House and th things of this nature to study the Gurdjieff work, um, the mystery school aspect around Gurdjieff was suggesting uh, what Gurdjieff would suggest that groups work together, but he would say, you know, they, they could be groups of a hundred didn't have to be like anything larger than that. And that they would have to learn how to use those techniques, self-remembering and uh, the things that are in the fourth way system in order to survive societal collapse. And um, I think that all of that was laid out there. And it's interesting because one of the things that Gurdjieff said about schools, the mystery schools, is that they, they weren't there to be a perpetual institution in the public realm and all the rest of it, that they were, would come in to the public scene, spread their seeds of knowledge and wisdom, move the culture in the right direction, and retract back to their... Um, place without interfering directly with humanity and have humanity pick up on the kind of footprints that they left behind. So the question is, have we picked up on what the mystery schools have left behind? The public mystery schools, anthroposophy, theosophy, the things that have come out. Um, how much have we worked through <laughs> uh, with those concepts? And is this a period where we're picking up the threads of that? That's a Pretty strong question to leave you with, I would say tonight. And with that, I'm Ms. Olivia, throw you're up. At you. Could you talk a little bit about attitude? I mean, the fact of the matter is, let's get real. Um, our the day in day out news cycle. Our having the right opinions about everything, knowing what's going on all the time, it doesn't actually impact it. We are most of us here are not terribly impactful in our lives, right? Except for the people in our lives, right? Our little corners of the world, right? So we have to ask ourselves, um, I know it's very humbling. What power do I actually have? What am I doing here? None of us is safe. Just being in a human body makes us unsafe, right? I could trip down the stairs tonight. That's it. It's the end. So, you know, much <laughs> less than, you know, a UFO uh, attack. Okay. Well, before so, you go any further, uh, no, no, go ahead. Finish okay. Up. So, so, I mean, this is where attitude comes in, yes. self-development. Yes. So 
if there is, if we live in a feel, right, just managing the emotions of this time of collapse, right? The energy that we're putting forth every day. Are we, are we being honest? Are we being kind? Are we being forgiving? Yeah. I don't, so, I, yeah. And also like power, I don't think is the answer either. Like, you know, when you say, Oh, I don't have any power anyway. Well, I mean, everyone has individual power, but power is not <laughs> an answer. And also um, affecting that little corner of the world that you're talking, I know exactly what you mean, but that corner of the world is, it's always, um, you're operating with the microcosm that echoes the mi macrocosm. So it is always the small strain, you know, so you've got, um, you know, you, ha you have to have Buddy Holly before you have the Beatles, right? You've got this, this thing that starts and it ripples out. And um, so that, I understand what you're saying, but there's, there can be great power just right where you are with what you're doing, uh, with your own interest and your own fascinations. But you're right that there's, um, you know, there's a natural kind of vulnerability uh, and that it isn't just a, like a physical mastery that you're looking for. It is a psycho-spiritual physical integration, right? It's the, um, and the thing about attitude is crucial because that's how you get it. It's interesting too, because Casey had said over and over again that thoughts are things and he always worked on the attitude regardless of the situation. And he would start even with the most, you know, somebody would be talking about the most severe problem health wise or whatever. They always work with the attitude first. Obviously it sets up the tone for the reality that you're going to create. Um, so he would say thoughts are things and they would ask him, well, how, how real are thoughts? And he would say as real as a pin in your finger. That's really real. <laughs> so uh, minding the thoughts is very important, but it's also like what you're saying, not getting into like, um, you know, fights on social media about social issues that just take all the energy, recycle it and drain it down some corporate drain. Um, you know, that is, a terrible waste and we need <laughs> we're going to need all that energy that we can for as mm -hmm. much inspiration as we have and with that miss olivia okay we are done well i have many people to thank uh <laughs> starting with a cult fan global atlantis susurration gill and joy r just loafing around it's a doughboy life uh the cove channel harvardian Medley Childress, Channeling the Heart, Barbara Joyce, Erica Swenson Elliott, Jennifer R., Ivan Langley, Peter Rabbit, Eurythmia is Fun, Doreen Hewitt, Robert Scott, Mike Sutherland, Susan Blackstone, John Folden, uh, Michael Tuamala, uh, Guardwatcher 12, Jay Parsons, Egyptian Princess, The Buddhas of Boston Sports, B. Brax, Johnny Ricardo Bown, and Catherine Farrell. Thank you so much for your generous super chats. Incredible. Wow. We really appreciate your support. It makes all the difference. And, um, to all of you who've supported the show, our subscribers uh, help us go and keep us going to report these incredible stories for you. And we really appreciate it. We'll be back with you next week. Have a fantastic July 4th, unless we see you with a special report between now and then. It's certainly possible. And um, I'll do a couple of shout outs here while I'm still contemplating your question. While you're doing that, Najat Madri said that uh, July 2nd is UFO day. Did you know that? Is it really? I well, I like was going to say that today is the, this is interesting you said that because today is the anniversary of Alternative 3, which was the incredible 1977 broadcast on British television about all these scientists disappearing and being sent to the moon. But then later, <laughs> this book came out, and uh, the, I'll just read the back of this. In 1977, television documentary was screened that shocked the world. Then suddenly it was declared a hoax, but was it? One man, veteran Fleet Street reporter Leslie Watkins, didn't think so. What he discovered was terrifying, a secret plan to evacuate Earth, mysterious death, faked photographs of Mars, and the sudden disappearance of eminent scientists. He too was declared a hoaxer, a writer of science fiction, and a fanaticist. But was he? The claims he made in the book Alternative 3, first published in 1978, were ridiculed, and some assert suppressed by government 
but the truth is hard to conceal. Nearly 40 years later, the world is hurtling towards destruction. Um, it, it's pretty interesting, and everything around Alternative 3 has that strain of truth in it put out in an unusual fashion, but I think it fits in exactly with what we were talking about with the breakaways break in <laughs> this time as well. Um, I'll do some shout outs here. Black Parson, it's great to see you. <laughs> Not dead yet. I like that one. Mm -hmm. Apollo, excellent. Dean Terrett, Modwiz, Alien Pride, exactly. <laughs> um, Traveling Riverside Blues, oh, I missed that one. Great show, there for all. Thank you, DJ. Thank you, Jimmy. It's great to have you here. Wayne Peak, follow the path with heart. I like that a lot. Scarlet Fire, last words. Security without liberty is a, a is called prison. Benjamin Franklin. Well, Benjamin knew. <laughs> he learned at the Hellfire Club. All those. <laughs> uh, Najat Madri, good night, X fam. Good night, Najat, and uh, Bravo, Miss Olivia. Nicely done. Excellent questions. Well done. Do you have any last words there for tonight? No, I just, I, you know, everybody, everybody has messages uh, from their guides that they're ignoring. Stop ignoring them. I'm saying this for myself too. <laughs> I've been told to meditate yes. I, again and again. I'm resisting yeah, yeah. it. I have, I have to meditate. It's better. Yes. It'll make me a better person. Uh, it'll help me ripple out better energy. I'm just going to throw it out to the ideas room. What are you avoiding? Right. Cleaning ah. that closet, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know, get, we all, when we're spending too much time on social media and we're getting too negative and we're getting too fearful about anything like, mm, you know, put it aside and work on the real things, the things that matter to our actual lives and to our Oh boy. That's absolutely true. My God. Um, RFK is the same look as DJ actually skinnier tie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll work on it. I'll work on it. Uh, yeah, he, you know, he, uh, he's been doing some incredible appearances lately and just really, um, you know, I want to say this as a kind of a parting thing, but Reason Magazine, which is supposed to be this like libertarian, you know, Reason Magazine, it's supposed to be a big libertarian thing and they've held this up and, oh, we're big libertarians and everything else. They put Bobby Kennedy on and they pressure him about how great vaccines are and how he's wrong to put them in the spotlight. I mean, you okay, know. well you've run a magazine, you understand that it's all advertiser driven. True. But you know, like I said, if you're in the truth telling business and you can't tell the truth, you get out of the business. Mm. Like, I mean, that's ridiculous. I was, I was embarrassed for them. And I, he, he was like, Hey, look, you know, I, I've got the study, you know, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> well said, Olivia wings girl. There you go. <laughs> Tim Houston. I saw part of that interview, Amy, right? Yes. This is absurd beyond absurd. And they, they were totally wrong too, <laughs> which makes it even funnier. There's what I've realized lately is there are a lot of people who have toxic jobs that should not, those, they should not have those jobs because those jobs should not exist. Isn't that interesting? Yes, Tina Boric, agree with you there. A lot of NGOs. Manifest. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of, but you know, um, these scientific journals that are worth nothing now. Um, yeah, oh my God, think about it. Gil and Joy, wow, thank you. <laughs> Let the love shine. Fantastic, and great to have you both here with us. Um, we've had a great night being here with you for this X-Series 153 UFO file wars and the breakaways break back in the rise of x protect more to come uh and more you have some mystery school shows coming up <laughs> as well and uh we will see you all next week and you know it says and broadcast but after all never really ends <laughs> never really ends sun hero thank you parting shot on the way out and um let's see I didn't get to ask you a question I wanted to ask. Nope. Just a, it's a little one. It's a little one. Sure, of course. Okay. Uh, Contain Command, wants, if JK wanted to share the UFO file with Khrushchev, 
wouldn't he have contacted the Holy See as a Catholic to find out what they had on file? Is there any record of him contacting the Vatican um, that you know of? I mean, the Vatican is pretty tight with those things, but certainly um, it's a good it's a good point. It's a good question as well. But the uh, the Kennedys being the first Catholic president, he had all kinds of channels in regard to that. And the study, of course, that went out was the Brookings Institute study um, under the Kennedy presidency, which was how would the public react to the UFO file being revealed. So uh, certainly he, he had that uh, whole piece there and that would have been part of the equation. But remember the first thing that he was going to share the UFO file with, he was going to share it with the Russians to avoid a nuclear uh, situation and to get them on the same parity with the knowledge. And um, so that's, that's a step before coming out to the public with it. So certainly interesting indeed, but um, Kennedy, you know, was an incredible thinker and, it was funny because one of the comments that Gorbachev made when he visited the school book depository, which is an extraordinary thing to do. Um, he said that Kennedy was so advanced in his thinking that we were just catching up to his vision of world freedom and peace now. And, um, you know, unfortunately they're dumping all that out with the neocons, but certainly Kennedy's vision, there's a reason why it's Camelot and why it survives. And uh, I think in the voice uh, and the, the true kind of um, courage of Bobby Kennedy Jr., we're seeing that. Not that he's, you know, some, you know, Kennedy person who has to be just like his dad or his uncle, but he, he certainly has shown a lot of coverage on his own, but he has that uh, streak. He's got it. And I, you know, watch. He's one to watch because uh, he's really the wild card <laughs> in all this and really bringing on the transparency. So God bless him. He's doing some incredible things and um, we're going to have him. We're going to have him on the show pretty soon. Everyone, it's been a great night. Thank you so much. And uh, we will have you all back next week. Right on. <laughs> and remember, never let it be forgot.